30th, Wednesday a.m. session of the Portland City Council. Sue, so please call the roll. Here. 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 Good morning. Welcome to the Portland City Council. The City Council represents all Portlanders and meets to do the city's business. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during City Council meetings so that everyone can feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. To participate in council meetings, you may sign up in advance with the council clerk's office for communications to briefly speak about any subject. You may also sign up for public testimony on resolutions or the first readings of ordinances. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. When you have 30 seconds left, a yellow light goes on, and when the time is done, a red light goes on. If you're in the audience and would like to show your support for something that is said, please feel free to do a thumbs up. If you want to express that you do not support something, please feel free to do a thumbs down. Disruptive conduct such as shouting or interrupting testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being ejected for the remainder of the meeting. After being ejected, a person who fails to leave the meeting is subject to arrest for trespass. Thank you for helping your fellow Portlanders feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. Thank you. Uh, first up is communication. Sue, if you could read the first individual's name. Request of David Keith Davis to address council regarding city-sponsored political terrorism, and that's item 531. <clears throat> so, um, I wanted to address you guys about the war on cop watchers and how Portland's in a constitutional crisis and you guys don't seem to uh, respect the Constitution and I'm uh, more pointing out Nick Fish and Ted Wheeler specifically. And Ted Wheeler, don't interrupt me this time when I'm talking, okay? Because this is my time, not yours. And you too, Nick Fish. There's rules to this uh, thing, just like the ones he read off, okay? Now, uh, Jeff Black, the filmmaker is working on the uh, murder of Kwanis Hayes. You know, he had talked about the war on cop watchers last week at the uh, John Elifritz hearing press conference outside. And uh, he was talking about how that's a violation of the DOJ settlement too. And especially if some of us uh, might have some mental illnesses which uh, there are certain people, I'm not gonna name names, but uh, there are people that do have mental illnesses that are cop watchers, okay? And so you guys, with your unconstitutional war on cop watchers, are guilty of retaliation, ADA violations, civil rights violations, conspiracy to deny civil rights, which is a felony. And this is all gonna be uh, brought to federal court here pretty soon, because you wanna know what? We're getting a team of lawyers on our side. Your, your little days are numbered, okay? The menacing, abusive, unconstitutional behavior at City Hall and by the Portland police needs to end. We should be able to at least film the police without dealing with uh, all these various things from illegal arrest to uh, getting stabbed, like Eli got stabbed and Oh, they didn't find any charges. Then there's John Hughes here, who's, uh, you know, he's in the paper, K2, all over. Man indicted on new murder charges and gun charges. That's uh, Pete Simpson's uh, relative who lived at his mom's house up until recently. And uh, he choked, choked Robbie Estabrook's girlfriend when she went to film outside of Pete Simpson's mom's house and also sawed his phone in half 
the, the judge and the DA dropped the charges, and then they gave Eli a quarter of a million dollar bail for filming the police. So you guys are letting people that actually murder members of the community choke women, Ooh. attack cop watchers, smash their phones, smash their cameras. My, my camera was destroyed by an out-of-town mayor. The DA didn't find anything about that. Ted Wheeler, you said I threatened your daughter and your wife Thank you. when I organized a protest outside of your house. Thank that you. is constitutionally protected, and that is not a threat, and I didn't even know you had a daughter. But if Mr. I did Davis, know, you, if I did know please, you have a daughter, I still a would have a protest outside of your house. Thank you. That's not what I was referring to. Next but, um, individual, be more, please. Be specific, because that's part of the Next allegation. individual, please. Your family and stuff. I mean, I know Item 532, request of Jim Braley to address council regarding waiver of remonstrance. Excuse me, sir. You're going to have to be quiet. This is but somebody like else's that, time. If you cannot be quiet, you're going to have to leave. Can you hear what I said? No. If you cannot be quiet, you should give me some points. One moment, sir. Go ahead, sir. Sorry for the interruption. My name is Jim Brawley, and I live in the West Portland Park neighborhood. I recently discovered. There's a street waiver. You gotta get, I gotta get my camera. I'm not leaving this behind. Oh. I recently discovered there's a street waiver on the house that my wife and I bought in 2005. I'm learning about this 13 years later because our neighborhood is involved in a possible local improvement district to pave streets. The estimate is that each home would have to pay about $45,000. <coughs> Nobody was aware of this when they bought their home. Nobody in our neighborhood can afford to pay it outright, and if you finance it over 20 years, it's about $70,000, and that becomes a lien on your house. The street waiver is a city document that was signed only by our builder, Joe Bashalt, and all six of his houses on Vicuna and Coronado have waivers. The city allowed him to build without improving the road. Instead, with the waiver, the city obligated future home buyers to pay if an LID is formed. Just a few blocks from us, there are other relatively new homes where the developer did put in paved streets with curbs and sidewalks. Apparently, the city required that builder to do the work as part of the project. This feels unfair and inequitable. But there's a bigger problem. The street waiver was never disclosed to us, not by the builder, not by First American Title, not by Hassan Realty. And our signatures are not on the waiver. How could they be? It was recorded by the city months before we bought the house. And there's not even a place on the form for us to sign it. Everyone knows that for a contract to be legal, it needs to be signed by both sides. There's a state law, ORS 41.580, that addresses this. From what I've learned, the only way you might discover a street waiver is if you have a knowledgeable real estate agent. It's not obvious. When I went looking, Bureau of Development Services had no record of the waiver on our house because it was on file with Portland Bureau of Transportation. A lack of transparency generally means they don't want you to know what's going on. Donald Trump doesn't disclose his tax returns. Portland Public Schools doesn't disclose there's lead in drinking water. In my opinion, the street waiver process is kind of a fraud and the city should quit using it unless you require that the waiver be disclosed to home buyers and it has their signature. Beyond that, Portland should require all of developers to put in paved streets. Evidence that the city doesn't do this is everywhere. Most neighborhoods have decent streets, but many others have gravel roads full of potholes. I'm not from Portland originally, so how this happens here is puzzling to me. It's also a big disappointment. And it makes me cynical about how Portland city government works. Thank you for letting me speak on this Mr. issue. Mr. Braley, can I just ask you a quick question? <clears throat> yes. Um, you, you said in your testimony that it had been recorded? The street waiver uh, is a one-page document. Where, where had it been recorded? Where had it been recorded? Right. In Multnomah County, Oregon, by C. Swick, deputy clerk. So it's a, so the only reason I ask is having purchased and sold a house where 
I had to sign a, like a, a phone book uh, a set of documents of disclosures and other uh -huh. kinds of things. Um, you know, I think I think the question you raise about notice to a subsequent buyer is a good a good question. And if if what you're telling us is that it's recorded, but a buyer with reasonable diligence cannot cannot dis discover that, I think that's something the council will be interested in. They, 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 this is not a game of gotcha, and in fact, the person who manages our remonstrance program is probably one of the finest public servants that we deal with on a regular basis. But if if, if what you're saying is there's some flaw in the way these things are are recorded, so that a buyer doesn't get adequate notice. I think that's something we'd like to know more about. So did you did you bring some materials for the council? I have the street waiver itself and Can I, I make a suggestion? If you could make copies of your documents and just give them to the clerk, the then I think we can uh, we can follow up on it. Okay, I'll just mention that in our title documents through First American Title, there was no disclosure of this. And that may mean that I don't want to. I'm not playing your lawyer here, but that may mean you have a claim against your title company. You may have a claim, which, which by the way, title companies get sued from time to time for these very reasons. You may have a claim against your realtor. The question is, what, what, what did you have a legal right to know? Things like easements on properties get disclosed. All kinds of things get disclosed. Mm -hmm. And if this wasn't disclosed, and might have impacted your decision to buy the property, that that's a serious issue. It absolutely would, because you would probably try to negotiate a lower price on the house exactly. if you knew that. So could you just make, you uh, know, my office is down here. Uh -huh. uh, we'd be happy to Xerox it for free. And if you could just then give it to the council clerk so we can follow up. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a very persuasive and common sense argument. Thank you for coming in. Uh, next individual. Item 533, request of Russell Sr. to address council regarding public telecommunications utility. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Russell Sr. I'm the president of a volunteer-based nonprofit called the Personal Telco Project. We are known in Portland for building and managing free to the end user public uh, access Wi-Fi <coughs> networks. In addition to building networks, we advocate for, for an end to the monopoly power that incumbent telecommunication companies currently hold. I'm also active with Municipal Broadband PDX. It has a Facebook group of about 3,000 people and has reached out to build political support for this long overdue idea. We have support from Multnomah County Democrats, some community and labor groups, and many in the small business community and the general public. I'm here today, and I'm here on behalf of all internet subscribers and would-be internet subscribers in the city to ask for your help. Today, access to the internet is no more a luxury than paved streets or clean tap water. Your constituents, businesses and residents alike, are in the clutches of big telco, empowered by a federal regulatory regime that cedes control to the owners of the last mile infrastructure. Big Telco has absolute power to define service options you have on their network, set prices arbitrarily, sell your browsing histories, employ whatever other business strategy rings the maximum profit for their shareholders. The only practical way to escape this intolerable situation is for the users and would-be users to become owners of the infrastructure so it can be managed in their interests. Municipal broadband has been described here as not possible. I would direct your attention to page 51 of the 2007 feasibility study, which projected at the end of 20 years, the network would be $118 million in the black, even under their wildly pessimistic 6% bond interest rate. Comcast alone takes in about $200 million per year in revenue from your constituents. Much of that revenue is pure profit made possible by the monopoly power. In the decades, the decade since the 2007 study, that accrued revenue could have built a public fiber network several times over. It is time to seriously pursue an at-cost fiber optic network. There is a revenue model to support it. Hundreds of communities around the country have done this. Here in Oregon, we have Sandy, Monmouth Independence, and now Hillsboro. Last week, a budget amendment for $150,000 was proposed by the Multnomah County 
uh, to help fund a new feasibility study taking into consideration the changed cost and market reality since 2007, as well as the consequences of doing nothing. We are asking the City of Portland to match that amount as a first step towards building a network that can serve, that can serve the people of Portland instead of enslave them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Mr. Senior, yes. instead of doing special appropriations, we have a fund that you will be able to apply for for a grant to do what you just asked for. So the application should be out fairly shortly. Okay, thank you. Next individual, please, Sue. Item 534, request of Si Jin Nun to address council regarding Portland State University MFA in art and social practice program activities. Good morning. Morning, hi everyone. Um, I'm C. Tia and I'm from Singapore and today I'm representing the graduate program at PSU in Art and Social Practice and I'm here to talk about Assembly, our annual art event, a co-authored social practice art conference. Our theme this year is civics and our first day is gonna be at City Hall this Friday all day from nine to six, uh, thanks to a collaboration with Chloe Udeli and um, Polly Ann. And so I'm gonna talk a bit about this event. Uh, last year's Assembly, we had a silent canoe ride down the Columbia River Slough, a collaboration with the lunch ladies at the Native American Youth and Family Center, as well as Martin Luther King Jr. School. And we also had an artist work with children at Martin Luther King Jr. School to create sculptures where they can process their emotions. So in this year's theme, uh, under this, this year's theme of civics, uh, the questions we're interested in asking are, what is civic engagement? What are civic institutions? How are they functioning? And how are we, we relating to them? So the lineup of events, uh, spectate or speculate, two artists created the Office of Landlord Tenant Affairs, or their own version of it, following Mayor Wheeler's proposal of this in 2016. Dial an old friend where you can call the city's wisest citizens uh, who are gonna give advice representing each city department in collaboration with Hollywood Senior Center. Remnants of the Color Blue, a collaboration with a former inmate at Columbia River Correctional Institution, uh, a minimum security male prison in Northeast. Uh, Richard, a formerly incarcerated individual, is gonna be presenting his artwork and there's gonna be a panel discussion. Difference is a field, a participatory event about having meaningful dialogue with someone you deeply disagree with. Exchange endowments uh, to endow funding in perpetuity for, once a year, for a once a year lunch between an employee at City Hall and an artist. Citizen 100, a critical examination of citizenship in today's world in collaboration with seventh grade students from Martin Luther King Jr. School in their civics class. The whole class is gonna <coughs> come here at 1 p.m. on Friday. And My One Project, the City Seal of Portland, Oregon, uh, proposing an update to the Portland City Seal. I went to the City Archives, touched documents from 1978, have been getting designs from the men at the Columbia River Correctional Institution and children at King School, and we're hoping to propose it, have a voting ceremony this Friday and propose a new design to all of you. Pluralist Practices in Portland, a panel about cultural pluralism and creative activism in Portland, <coughs> uh, a one-on-one -on -one forgiveness session, as well as an ex exploration of seeding space to generate opportunities for others. So I believe some of you might have the catalog already, and for the rest of you, there'll be catalogs available at the news rack on the way out, as well as downstairs. Again, we'll be at the atrium on Friday from nine to six. Um, employees, please let your... Employers, please let your employees uh, off for an hour or two to attend our events. Uh, you folks are the people that we really want to engage with our event, so come reflect on these issues with us. Thank you so much. Wonderful. And more information available at our website. Commissioner thank you. Daly. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank you today for coming to give that preview. I'm a big fan of the art of social practice and the social practice program at PSU. Thank you. And it's really a treat to get to work with you guys. Thank year. you for hosting our event. It means a lot to us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Looks like a lot Thank of you. fun. Thank yeah, you so please much for drop by. Up. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to it. Thank you. Uh, one more individual. Sue, so last individual, please. Request of Larry Snell to address council regarding hiring dismissal procedures. That's number 535. Mr. Snell. Possibly not present. Uh, looks that way. Very well. Um, could we please uh, 
Could you please tell me, Sue, has anything been pulled off of the consent agenda? Three items, number 544, 545, and 547. 544, 545, and 547? <coughs> Correct. Very good. We have legal counsel here now waiting for this and anticipating 544. Uh, your anticipation turned out to be accurate, so why don't we go ahead and take this item while we have legal counsel with us? So I know she has to go elsewhere. Good morning. Good morning, your, uh, Mayor. And could you and still read 544 again just so people know what we're talking about? Item 544. Authorize the city attorney to institute legal proceedings against Clark County, Washington, to seek an injunction prohibiting the release of city records without further redaction. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Council. Um, I'm Tracy Reeve. I'm the Portland City Attorney, and with me is Rebecca Plaza, who's a senior deputy city attorney and who oversees our public safety group. Um, we are before you with this resolution because um, a number of years ago, uh, the Portland Police Bureau released a record uh, at the request of Clark County, Washington, uh, that was a police report of, uh, of a child sex abuse incident. At the time uh, of the incident, which occurred in 1992, the child uh, was four years of age. Under Oregon law, um, child sex abuse reports are protected from disclosure under ORS Chapter 419B. Um, Clark County notified us when they received a public records request that included this record, um, and they notified us that under Washington law, uh, they would be able to make only minimal redactions, removing the victim's name, but not, not other identifying information and not the information about the content of the report detailing the abuse. PPB was concerned about this and their victim advocate reached out to this victim and that victim indicated very strongly that they wished to have the confidentiality of the record protected. Clark County has given us some additional time before releasing the record uh, and notified us that the, the way we could seek to address this issue was to ask a court uh, for relief uh, in the form of injunctive relief, asking for either that the record not be released or that it only be released with further redactions. Um, and because of the very unique circumstances of this case and because we believe that with the events having occurred in Oregon, the record being a PPB record and the victim being located here, that um, Oregon has the predominant interest. And so we would like the opportunity to present that legal issue to the Washington County Court and ask them to uh, evaluate this record under Oregon law because it's an Oregon record and the bulk of the contacts are with Oregon. Very good. Um, could I ask you a couple of questions of course. about this? Um, number one, I, I get the gist of it. Number two, um, if we support this, what we are supporting is this will ultimately go to a judge for a final determination. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, I assume that this is being done in collaboration with Clark County, it does not seem like this is being seen as a hostile act. This seems like there is almost a desire that this conflict be resolved through a court. Certainly Clark County has been cooperative from notifying us and then from giving us additional time to seek this relief. They understand the city's position. They simply feel legally constrained. And so yes, it's not a, it's not a hostile. Everyone agrees that this is the way to sort this out. So um, the Oregonian this morning had an editorial on this subject. I saw that. They raised a couple of very valid points. There's some big issues at play. Um, the reason that we are uh, evaluating this is number one to resolve the conflict between Oregon and Washington statute in these matters and so there's a precedence question the other issue that was raised by the editorial was the question of redaction more generally speaking anytime government redacts that comes at the cost of transparency and potentially government accountability how would you respond to the larger question in this particular case um, that this is a justifiable redaction or alternatively, how can you 
uh, what can you say to the public that says there goes government redacting information that should be publicly disclosed? What confidence can you give the public that this is the right thing to do? Well, or that there are checks and balances in this right. process? So a couple of things. One is that I think everyone would agree that everything that the city has and uses for its business is a public record. That means, for example, that all of the taxpayer information that we have that's confidential, social security numbers, employer identification numbers, et cetera, are public records. We don't obviously turn those over willy-nilly in response to public records requests because there are very legitimate privacy concerns that the legislature has recognized. So too, in this situation, the Oregon legislature has made a policy decision that these records should be protected from disclosure because that balance tips in favor of the child sex abuse victim. We have this unique situation here where we gave our record to Clark County for a law enforcement purpose and then the public record request was made there. So this is a very unique circumstance, but the policy decision, I would argue, has already been made by the Oregon legislature that in balancing transparency versus confidentiality for child sex abuse victims, they've come down on the side in that specific category of cases on confidentiality. So the city, you know, we respond to the vast majority of public records requests by releasing the records. On occasion, there is a balancing that needs to occur um, as to, you know, legitimate privacy interests, for example, of members of the public who give us information that they assume will be kept confidential. And so we evaluate that on a case-by-case -case basis. This process that is set out is when there is disagreement about that um, to have a legal mechanism for a trier, a fact, a decision maker to resolve that. In most cases here, it's the district attorney. In some cases, it's the circuit court. Similarly, in Washington, the Washington Superior Court would be asked to look at these at, at the interests that the Oregon legislature has already established for confidentiality for child sex abuse victims versus washing, the balance Washington has struck and to make a decision about which state has the greater interest in which state's law should apply. So in this case, we have a then four-year-old victim of sexual abuse whose advocate is asking that we redact specific information from this record, information I just want to fully disclose, I have not seen, so I don't know what the specific information is. The concern being re-victimizing the four-year-old exactly. through this process. But to be clear, just so I understand the process, it will go to a judge in Washington state who will then look at the actual information and determine whether or not it is in the public's interest to disclose that information or not. Correct. And if we vote no on this, um, that process simply never happens or what happens? If we vote no on this, Clark County will release the record on June 12th? June 13th. 13th. Okay. May, may I, may I? Commissioner in? Fish. So Tracy, I, I really appreciate you bringing this forward and I appreciate the mayor putting it up front because I think um, this is a, a very important question. A couple of things. Um, the four-year-old victim in 1992 today would be about 30 years old? Correct. Okay. We don't have any, we don't have any extensive information about whether that person is currently in therapy, whether they have a, a, an advocate, uh, or, or what the n numerous bases might be as to why this, this individual does not want this record disclosed, correct? Correct. The only thing we know for sure is that under Oregon law, there's a flat prohibition of disclosing this unless you go through a process at, that, with the DHS, a correct. state agency. So you had mentioned earlier that some public records issues are resolved on a balancing test that's ultimately decided <coughs> by the, the district attorney or the court. That's, this is not one of them. That's correct. We, we have the legislature, not the city council, has made a judgment that these records should not be disclosed absent very compelling circumstances, and you'd have to go through an administrative process. Is that correct? That's correct. What, what, now, neither the mayor nor any member of council, to my understanding, has actually read the document. So we don't know whether there's information about other family members, if there's information about the specific crime. What we do know is you have a four-year-old victim 
and we do know that there was a perpetrator either pled out or was convicted of a crime, correct? That's correct. Now, our assumption is that, that Clark County requested this information uh, at some point uh, in order to enforce a law that requires a convicted sex offender to register in a new jurisdiction. Is that correct? That is our assumption. So the, the, the bigger takeaway from me before I get to the specific question before us is um, th does this case prompt us to revisit what information we provide to sister law enforcement jurisdictions? But, for example, if all they need is proof that someone was convicted without the underlying documentation, uh, it seems to me that would be a policy change that we should look carefully at, correct? So that we're just giving the minimal amount of information to any other jurisdiction? That is true, and this has highlighted that issue for us. We're working with the Bureau to explore ways that they can furnish the information that other jurisdictions need without ending up in this situation again. And let's go back to the choice of law question, because, um, you know, before I was elected to this council, um, I practiced law for 22 years, and one of the things that I was always struck by in litigation is that one of the first questions a court would decide is which law applies. And, and that's why you have judges. Judges make those decisions. Uh, in federal court, you have conflicts of law that happen more regularly because in federal court, you typically have parties from different states or different jurisdictions. But this issue about whether a court chooses to enforce this law or this law, that, that's not a radical notion, right? That's, that's what judges do. They, they decide what body of law applies, and then they apply it. Absolutely. I remember first year civil procedure learning about choice of law. And, 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 and as a technical matter, while we often see federal judges make those decisions, this state court judge may also decide based on the policy considerations, the history of the interest that Oregon has, and Oregon's clear statement of the law, to apply our values and principles in deciding this question, correct? Absolutely. State court judges, although you're right, of course, Commissioner, that it's more common in federal courts, state courts also make choice of law decisions. Now, we were notified of this as a third-party notification from Clark County, and that's a routine matter, right? They're getting a records request. It's our record, and they give us notification. So that's nothing abnormal about that. That's correct. The notice to the city said, if you have a concern about this record being disclosed, i.e., we recognize that this, this could not be disclosed under Oregon law. Uh, then your recourse is to bring an injunction, meaning uh, bring a legal proceeding and ask a judge to decide it, correct? That's correct. And to the mayor's point, that is viewed as a, as a legal uh, uh, a garden variety kind of proceeding where, where we allow a, a neutral third party to decide the question that may be in dispute. Exactly. But let's be clear, um, if this perpetrator today abandoned the, the Clark County proceeding and came to Oregon and said, I want these records, he or she could not get them. That's correct. All right, so, so um, to the editorial, which I read with some interest today, because it seems to me it omitted a lot of relevant information, including the age of the victim, including the fact that there is a, proceed, a, a judicial pr uh, a pro a pr procedure to decide these questions. Um, and by the way, for those who who argue that we should never have a district attorney or a judge decide these cases. You know, I'm all for eliminating our whole judicial system. We could save a lot of money. No, seriously. And, and I would remind people that the cases that get to the Supreme Court have usually been decided by three, four, five, six courts. And if we really want to save money, we could just have one judge decide it and not have an appeal and save a ton of money. But cases that go to the Supreme Court often come up through the state court system, and they go to the federal court system, and they go to a federal appellate court. <coughs> and then they are heard by, by judges, a bigger panel of federal judges, and then they're remanded, and they're heard again. And of course, I'm not, I'm not typically aware of people referring to that as a manip manipulation. We actually treasure that as part of the due process in our country to make sure we get a good decision. So um, what is the, quote, manipulation here that the Oregon Editorial Board refers to of the city seeking a uh, uh, a, a ruling from a uh, independent court, frankly, a court of another state. So you could argue the deck is a little stacked. What's the manipulation in honoring the request of the victim and having the court decide this question? Well, frankly, Commissioner Fish, I'm not aware of anything about that that is manipulation. Uh, having a unbiased decision maker resolve issues such as this is really the foundation of the rule of law in our democracy. 
So, and finally, the mayor and colleagues, if public records absolutists believe that Oregon law is wrong, there is recourse. That is to bring uh, a bill before the legislature because this has been decided. We do not give out this information uh, unless you go through a, an extensive administrative process and then we get to balance things like the impact um, on, on the victim and the victim's family and having this information out there. And, and frankly, knowing nothing about this, I can just only imagine we can only imagine the kind of information that someone would not want disclosed in a case that is, you know, now what, almost 20 years stale. This person may have a family. This person, there may be other people identified in, in this report. We can only imagine. Oregon has decided that question. So the only question before us is, do we authorize you to let a judge in the state of Washington decide whether Oregon's concerns trump the more lax standards in Washington, yay or nay? And what would be the cost of that litigation? Well, we're already uh, here working, and um, we may have some uh, relatively minor filing fee, but other than that, there will be no cost. And is it conceivable that even if we lose this proceeding in standing up for this victim, it also help us, helps us, whatever the ruling is, helps shape whatever policy that we adopt going forward about what records we do share with sister jurisdictions in the future. Certainly, and it will, you know, we're gonna work on that issue and this will inform that. Well, thank you for a very clear presentation. Thank you. So, uh, I'm just curious, who, who is requesting this public record in Washington? We believe, based on the information available to us, that it is the alleged, or well, not alleged, because they pled guilty and were convicted, but the perpetrator. That is our belief. Uh -huh. Public testimony? This is the public's time. Help guide us. Good for Portland. Um, I think uh, that the, the victim in this case uh, definitely, regardless of the person's age today, uh, that their identity uh, should be protected. And um, I think uh, the Mary, city- Mary, can I just qualify something for you? Mm -hmm. um, they are willing to redact the name, but as you can imagine, There's a report more. that has other identifying information yep. can not only help someone connect the dots to the victim, but to family members and other members. So you're, you are, in, and we, I'm just talking conceptually here, a lot, of a lot of different individuals could be unmasked, if you will, through the disclosure of this, and simply redacting the victims, anybody can put two and two together at some point. Yeah, yeah. and you know, and that's, that's my broader point, is that I, I think um, that uh, you're doing the right thing uh, by going down the path that you're going down to, um, have, have a, a judge or somebody make this decision, and uh, I, I applaud you. I support it. Thank you. Yes, my name is Lightning. I represent Lightning Super Creativity Watchdog. Again, my concern is the perpetrator. It appears to me that is there in any way that the perpetrator is being protected by this? I would like full disclosure who that is. I'd like to understand what state that person is living in. I'd like to understand what type of job they currently have. I'd like to understand if they're running for any political office. I'd like to understand why the city of Portland is positioning themselves right now so aggressively on this one particular case to, in my opinion, almost keep it kind of hush and not have things disclosed. What is the true motivation behind the city of Portland to do that? Do they do that on other cases? Have they done that on other cases? But what is it about this case right now that they want to step in and do this? I want to have a clear understanding from my position who the perpetrator is, where that perpetrator resides, what information the public has on that perpetrator? And is this a way to keep that silenced 
at this time from the city of Portland because Washington wants to release that information if I'm correct. But the city of Portland, for some reason, wants to silence certain things on this agreement. And I want to see all of the information. Now, I'll agree. The victim has a right not to be disclosed. But is that what we're trying to do right now and only right now on the victim? So are they just going to look at the victim's name and cross that over? Or are they going to start crossing out other names? And that's what I want to know. Is the city of Portland in any way protecting the perpetrator and their family members and their relatives and anybody around this perpetrator in any way? And that's why they're taking an aggressive approach right now. Or have they done this in the past? And they were successful. Obviously, they haven't been. But yet, they're really focusing right now on this situation. So I just want to see all the details. Again, I don't want to know who the victim is, not from my position. But I want to know who that perpetrator is. And I want to know more facts and more data on this and not to keep it hush. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is morning. Joe Walsh, and I represent Individuals for Justice. We, we were thoroughly confused with this item. We didn't understand how in God's name you could put it on consent agenda. We just had an intelligent, good discussion on this item. But you wanted it on consent agenda, and at least the three people who spoke on the council had no clue of what they were going to vote on. And you admitted that which drives us a little bit more crazy, that you're voting on something you do not understand. We didn't understand it. We, we took it that we have documents that Washington wants, and we want to redact it more than they do. That's what we got out of that. That's what the discussion is close to that. That's the main issue, I think. The other way around, we yeah. are more severe. Won't, cu won't cut into your time, Joe, but they have, Washington, Clark County has the document. That's what we didn't understand. Who had the documents? Clark County has the document. Where did they get the documents from? They got it from the city of Portland. Okay, stop there. Why can't we or the state of Oregon say, this is the way you're going to get the documents. Like, if I went to get the, the, these documents, I would probably be denied. So we do have safeguards. I'm suggesting that we extend the safeguards and say, this is our redacted policy, and I don't care if you're Joe Walsh or you're the DA for some city. This is what you're getting. Because it's our laws and it's our responsibility to keep those documents safe. So we were totally confused of how the hell did they get the documents? They already have them. All we're trying to do now, I think, is to stop them from actually publishing or making it public awareness or public documents. That's our suggestion. Our suggestion is to expand whatever is needed, and maybe uh, the city council could contact our representatives, and I surely will contact my representative, say, what is this? Why can't we stop this stuff? We are all in favor of the victim here. There's no argument here. We're just trying to figure out what the hell happened. And this is why we don't like these consent gender items, because we like these discussions intelligent. You, you are very, very good there, uh, Commissioner Fish. You asked really good questions. So are you, Mayor. That's what we need. Thank you. And uh, I'll pay you back some time later. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, have, Commissioner Fish. We have the city attorney just come back for one second. Uh, uh, Tracy, could you come back for one moment? Commissioner Fish has a follow-up question based on testimony. Oh, I'm sorry. We have one other. Uh, Cedric. Uh, Cedric, are you testifying on this matter? Yes. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, Cedric, why don't you go ahead and finish, and then we'll have Tracy. Thanks. Sorry. Let me, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I'm Cedric Wilkins. In the next couple of weeks, I will get involved with uh, immigrant rights. Perhaps this relates to their background and uh, digging up reasons why they shouldn't live here. And so I would prefer that these 
issues on people's background be kept as secret as much as possible. And so that's basically I side with Oregon and, and this attempt here. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Jeanette Thiebert. Um, didn't think I'd be speaking on this, but I'm gonna surprise you all and be under three minutes. Um, as a family member of a similar scenario, I'm, I'm encouraged by your line of question, Commissioner Fitch. Fitch. Um, I highly, a, a similar scenario played out amongst people that I care about. And that person was close to the same age of, of this individual. And if that came out again, it would totally unravel the victim's life. And so for that reason, I commend the type of questioning and the due diligence that your office is doing. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Fish. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have two questions. Um, Tracy, um, and one is suggested by testimony that we had before. Uh, in any uh, injunction proceeding that we initiate to have a court rule on this question, um, would the victim uh, have standing to intervene to uh, set forth his or her position on this case? We will provide the victim with notice, and I would think a court would find that the victim has standing. I think it's very important. I think the sense, my sense for my colleagues is uh, we'd want to make sure that the victim had a chance through, attorney, through an attorney to be heard on this question, because it's clear that if this proceeding uh, was initiated in Oregon, that the victim's interest would be protected by DHS and by state law, which is very clear. Absolutely. And my second question is just about how we avoid these situations in the future. And I realize this goes, this goes back to 1992, and I, I, don't, I don't know when these records were actually forwarded to Clark County, but when someone is convicted of a sex offense, they do have to register in every jurisdiction where they live, and presumably there's a standard protocol where police uh, agencies ask for some confirmation that someone was convicted. It seems to me we could come up with a template that gave them what they needed without revealing information that under Oregon law would be considered confidential. And Absolutely, and I think this has clarified for all of us that we need to have that type of procedure in place so we don't have this situation in the future. And I think we have the template um, that you suggested to me earlier when we spoke, which is uh, we currently go the extra mile to make sure that any information we share with a sister law enforcement agency is not used improperly by ICE in violation of state law, correct? Correct. So we, we have a mechanism to ensure that, that, uh, that our values and our laws are followed even if we share information with someone else. Correct. Thank you. Mayor. Commissioner Daly. Um, Tracy, I just want to thank you for your efforts on this. It's a really thorny issue and a difficult conversation. Um, as Commissioner Fish mentioned, uh, obviously when someone's convicted of a crime, that's a matter of public record. When someone's co uh, convicted of a sexual assault, they are required to register. That information is also available online. Um, and I, I just, I support um, shielding the survivor and which is what I would encourage everyone to call this individual 20 years later, they're a survivor, um, from any additional exposure or trauma, because we don't do nearly enough to support sexual assault victims to begin with, and um, this, this could be very devastating to this individual and, and other members of the family. And I just want to... Um state as well that PPB was very concerned about this and they're the ones who brought it to our intention because they were very concerned about uh, protecting the survivor. Very good. Thank you. Sue, please call the roll. Fish. Aye. Saltzman. Aye. Udaley. Aye. Fritz. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. Resolution is Thank adopted. You. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to something more cheerful, time certain item 536. Excuse please. me, Mayor, could we have the vote on the consent agenda? Oh, uh, I don't believe we did. Please call the roll. Fish? Aye. 
Kaufman? Aye. Hugh Daly? Aye. Fritz? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. Consent agenda is adopted. 536, please. 536, proclaim May 30 through June 12 to be 32nd Annual Great Blue Heron Week. Is Mike Houck here? Yeah. I know I saw there. him earlier. Yeah, he's here. There he is. Come on up, Mr. Houck. Mike Houck and friend. All right, while Mike is coming up, I want to read a proclamation on behalf of the Portland City Council in the city of Portland. This is, of course, Blue Heron Week, and in a moment, Mike is going to introduce us to a friend. Whereas the great Blue Heron is a majestic symbol of the city of Portland's efforts to restore, protect, and sustain ecologically healthy habitats for fish and wildlife and for the enjoyment of people across the region. And whereas Portland Parks and Recreation is the proud owner of 50 acres of Ross Island and are conducting ecological restoration on the island. And whereas the Bureau of Environmental Services adopted its new 10-year strategic plan continuing their commitment to watershed health and green infrastructure. And whereas the city has launched a major restoration effort in partnership with the US Army Corps of Engineers to improve fish and wildlife habitat at the 160 acre Oaks Bottom Wildlife Refuge. And whereas the city has adopted innovative wildlife strategies, including a new eco roof mandate and bird safe building requirements for the central city. And will continue to build upon these efforts by developing a light pollution ordinance. And whereas the city's Central Reach River Plan expands the Willamette River Greenway to 50 feet, sets ambitious targets for riverbank restoration, and whereas the city will update its floodplain management program to comply with the new federal requirements to protect salmon, to improve the ecological benefits of the river, and to increase resiliency in the face of climate change. And whereas, the south reach of the Willamette River planning by the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability will set a new renewed vision and strengthen connections to the river. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, the mayor of the city of Portland, Oregon, the city of Roses, do hereby proclaim May 30th through June 12th to be 32nd annual Great Blue Heron Week in Portland and encourage all residents to observe this week. And colleagues, uh, as we are often graced today, we are again graced by Mike Houck, who has been one of this city's great environmental leaders, and he's here to introduce us to his friend. Good morning, Mike. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Wheeler. Thanks for being and here. And commissioners. Yeah, 1986, uh, then Mayor Bud Clark gave a presentation welcoming address to uh, Western Association of uh, Fish and Wildlife Managers. And I think some of you are aware that he um, was, a, was and is, continues to be a canoeing enthusiast and a duck hunter. And he must have mentioned Great Blue Herons 10 or 15 times during his presentation. So I took the opportunity to grab him on the way out of the Hilton Hotel and suggested we should have a city bird, the Great Blue Heron. And he did say, whoop, whoop. And two <laughs> weeks later, we had a proclamation. And this may sound um, trivial to some people, but the fact of the matter is, as with today, this is the 32nd time I've been here. Um, it's provided us with an opportunity to interact with you and with city staff to reflect on all of the great work that has been done already to ensure herons will be around in another 50 or 100 years. And as you noted in the proclamation, what we intend to do to continue that work. Um, to that end, each year, um, we put on a number of events. Tomorrow night, uh, Commissioner Fish will be present um, for Tim, ba Tim Beatley's uh, bio Biophilic Cities presentation at Portland State University. Each year we do a, a canoe trip, kayak trip around Ross Island, which I would invite all of you to uh, participate in on, on June 10th. I've listed a number, number of other activities um, that we hold um, during this week. Um, each year um, I also read a poem from William Stafford. Unfortunately, Kim um, Stafford, who was just 
appointed poet laureate for the state of Oregon had to leave, so I will once again read it in, in Kim's absence. I will mention that Kim said that this is the only poem he actually saw William Stafford when he was poet laureate for the state of Oregon write. They were together in a motel room apparently in Washington, D.C., and uh, William Stafford said, I have to write this poem. I got to get it back to Hauk. And uh, so he was actually um, quite pleased to be able to be here this morning. Unfortunately, he had to leave, as I said. So what I'd like to do is, is close by simply reading the poem, which quite frankly, I was hoping he would read because I get kind of tear, teared up um, when I read it as such a spectacular comment on the importance of nature in the city in Portland. So I'll do my best to get through it. Thanks, Mike. Spirit of Place, Great Blue Heron. Out of their loneliness for each other, two reeds, or maybe two shadows, lurch forward and become suddenly a life lifted from the dawn or the rain. It is the wilderness come back again, a lagoon with our city reflected in its eye. We live by faith in such presences. It is a test for us, that thin but real undulating figure that promises, if you keep faith, I will exist at the edge where your vision joins the sunlight and the rain, heads in the light, feet that go down in the mud where the truth is. William Stafford. That's beautiful. And you uh, gave us a handout. Is this actually the original? That's his original. The original yep. poem. That's yep. impressive. And I did, at the, I can't remember who requested a couple of years ago, s submit the original to um, the city archives to make sure it was in the archives. That's great. Thank Good you, idea. Mike. Yeah. Mike, how many years have you done this? This is the 32nd year. It's really extraordinary. Um, could you take your crystal ball out for a second and, um, uh, and, and just give us a sense, let's say 10 years from now, if, if, if all the forces that you've helped unleash can come together and continue <coughs> to move forward, what might Ross Island look like? <coughs> yeah, my, my relationship with Ross Island goes back to 1979 when I was testifying before city council to have the Great Blue Heron colony protected with a 350-foot 350, 350 buffer. And actually at that hearing, Charles Jordan, who was city commissioner at the time, interrupted me at, and asked if that was the same bird that came into his backyard and ate his koi. Um, <laughs> fortunately, they did, in fact, put the buffer around the heron colony and, of course, Six or seven years ago, bald eagles moved in, the herons had to move out. Um, that's a very interesting question. As you know, the city now owns about 50 acres and, and is engaged in a lot of restoration. Um, I'm hopeful that we can have more interaction with Ross Island, sand and gravel, and look more seriously at expanding the restoration that they are currently undertaking um, as part of Superfund, perhaps. I could imagine additional funds to, to, to go beyond the minimum that Ross Island Sand and Gravel has been uh, um, asked to, uh, to complete, which they're pretty far behind schedule right now, actually. So I'm hopeful that we would have an island that has significantly more shallow water habitat and emergent wetlands and riparian habitat to go with Oaks Bottom Wildlife Refuge and the, and the Holgate Channel. That's probably about 350 or 400 acres of um, incredible habitat in the heart of the city. And I I'm also hopeful that we have a lot more protection and restoration on the banks of the Willamette River itself. Thank you. I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank you for doing this for 32 years and for all you've done over your career for uh, really opening nature in our city to, to everyone. You make it really hands-on and easy and you underscore the value of our environment. So thanks, Mike. Thank you, Commissioner Salzman. Actually, I will say that in 1982, when I became a urban naturalist at Audubon Society, um, I was told by most of the local planners, one in particular in Clark County, Clackamas County, that there is no place for nature in the city. <laughs> That's where we started in 1982, and I think we've come a long ways, thankfully. Indeed. Well, Mike, thanks to your leadership, it's nature in the city is actually one of our defining characteristics. So thank you for Great. that. Thanks for the continuing the fight. Great. Very good. Uh, would you mind if we, uh, we have a photographer? Could we I think it'd be great. I'd love down? it. Great. Thanks, Mike.
you ready? One, two, three. One, two, three. Amazing. <laughs> All right, that's fantastic. Next up, 537. 537. Accept donation of goods and services from downtown clean and safe for the improvement of downtown public solid waste and recycling collection. Colleagues, this ordinance is a continuation of a long-standing partnership between the Portland Business Alliance, Downtown Clean and Safe, and the city to improve the downtown public garbage can program. For over 20 years, Clean and Safe has provided various services to help manage the city's downtown trash removal and other cleaning services. This ordinance will allow, the, will allow the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability to accept the donation of a new style of garbage cans and additional services to further enhance the downtown public garbage can program. We recognize that the PBA has invested a significant amount of money in the downtown garbage can program over the years including previous donations of garbage cans, which will be refurbished as part of this new agreement. The city's acceptance of clean and safe donations will allow BPS, the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, to focus funding on their citywide public garbage can expansion project and other program improvements. The city values clean and safe's dedication to maintaining downtown as a vibrant and inviting place and their generous donations continue to support that viability and the livability of the downtown area. Thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mayor good morning. and Commissioners. My name is Jill Kolick, and I'm with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. I'm a sustainability manager. And before you today is an ordinance to accept a donation for goods and services from downtown clean and safe. The donation will enhance the city um, of Portland's Bureau of Planning and Sustainability's public trash can and recycling program in the downtown area. Um, as a reminder, BPS contracts with private haulers to collect garbage and recycling from cans and the public right away, located in a number of districts, including downtown. Um, and the, there's a number of downtown jobs, housing, visitors, the number just keeps increasing. And um, over the use, the cans have um, increased as well and we're requiring more investment to keep the operating effectively and efficiently. The city's acceptance of the clean and safe donation will allow BPS to focus funding on the citywide garbage can expansion program and other program maintenance. Uh, so the support of the program, the donation of goods and services will include new garbage cans to replace the older units. Um, they're gonna refurbish BPS owned solar operated compacting garbage cans. <laughs> And they're going to contract with a private company to provide cleaning and repair services for all of our garbage cans that we own downtown. Um, and there's also potentially other aspects of the agreement that haven't been sorted out, but we think there'll be other pieces that can further enhance the program. Um, this ordinance will have a positive long-term impact on the city's solid waste management fund by reducing city's expenditures and repair and maintenance of downtown garbage cans. Uh, the Memorandum of Understanding accompanying this ordinance described the roles and responsibilities for clean and safe and BPS staff. There's no additional BPS staff needed. It's all within our current structure. And the clean and safe and BPS collaboratively identified donations with a total value of $165,000 um, for the first year of their agreement. These goods and services will be paid directly by clean and safe and will not pass through city accounts or budgets. Um, so, in closing, uh, should the council approve this donation, all Portlanders and tourists will visit downtown would benefit from a cleaner, healthier neighborhood and business district. Thank you. 
Great, thank you. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners. I'm Lene Berg. I'm the Executive Director of Downtown Clean and Safe and the Vice President of Downtown Services for the Business Alliance. Good morning. Good morning. You've already talked a bit about um, the history of the district and the amenities that we provide downtown and our shared goal of a clean and vibrant central city. In 2009, when the uh, Clean and Safe District and the Business Alliance embarked on a partnership to provide the big bellies. At the time, that was state of the art. They promised to hold five times the capacity of a normal trash can. And although they do in many areas, we have noted with the increase in food carts and wet garbage that the big bellies just are not the right fit for the food cart areas. So in conjunction with BPS, we've identified the high capacity garbage cans, which we feel will replace the concrete rounds in some of the big bellies around the food carts and really address some of the concerns. I would like to highlight as a, uh, an indicator of the growing need for this that last year, our cleaners picked up almost 724 tons of garbage from city sidewalks downtown. That is up from 635 tons in 2016 and 485 in 2015. So you can see that the need for additional capacity is really growing. Um, my board, the Clean and Safe Board, has voted to support <coughs> these new high capacity garbage <coughs> cans. And we've earmarked 200,000 in this fiscal year and an additional 200,000 in the next fiscal year to convert all the remaining cement rounds to the high volume um, cans, which have a strong locking mechanism and will allow for the haulers to have a greater ease of pickup. With your support today, we are prepared to purchase 100 units that can be manufactured and deployed downtown by midsummer. In addition to the purchase of these new garbage cans, we have worked with local graphic designer Dan Stiles, who has designed downtown Portland holiday graphics for the past two years. In the past, we've used the Big Belly garbage cans, Big Belly garbage cans to showcase sponsors, scenic shots from downtown, and even district logos. As you can see, we feel this new garbage can purchase is an opportunity to break the mold and we can transform the entire garbage can into a, um, to bring more fun and energy to the streets downtown. So here is one example with a popsicle, but if you wanna go to the, run through the next ones, we envision characters including zoo animals, robots. Do I have to advance it? Okay. Zoo animals, robots, ice cream cones, books, and bicycles. We can do something standard or we can execute something quirky that fits with the unique character of Portland and create garbage cans that are enjoyed and photographed by locals and tourists. With, while this new design would incorporate a full wrap of the garbage can and not a partial wrap, the image and branding would still conform to the city's regulations regarding advertising in the right-of-way. We want to thank the City of Portland and the ongoing partnership we have with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability to ensure that downtown Portland is clean, safe, and an attractive place. Thank you. Thank you, Lene. Commissioner Fritz. Thank you for your partnership in this and for your innovation. Um, is there currently food uh, composting near the food carts? I believe the county um, is working on that, but I don't know in the back of the house if they're requiring that. Yeah, it seems like that's an opportunity for people to scrape off right. their leftovers, which then would be less going into the waste stream. Mm -hmm. Right. So I appreciate you looking into that. Thank yep. you. I'm just curious, uh, on the weekends, like after a very busy Saturday night, when is, when is the uh, garbage collected on Sundays? I don't know, but Kevin. <laughs> Uh, the garbage cans that get the most use, including those by the food cart pods, are emptied currently six days a week. So they're emptied very early in the morning on Saturday, but then not again until Monday morning. We are currently in the process of working with our private hauler to add that <coughs> seventh day collection on Sunday morning so that they wouldn't I go without collection for 24 that, hours. It seems to me that's the night they often get the most use. Yes. Good. Thank you. So um, we used to have or we still have recycling baskets kind of attached to some of our trash cans? In the, cans? Are in we, the downtown area? Yeah, are we doing away with that? I, I've never 
I don't know how effective it is for people to actually use those or not. But yeah, it's a mixed bag. Right it's yeah. somewhat effective, but we have removed them from parts of the downtown core. The new can will ha the new cans will have a shelf on the side where people can place right. their um, cans and bottles, oh, they won't. so they're more okay. easily easily um, picked up by people who use them for to Deposit. redeem them. Yeah, okay. that's a good idea. And those skin, Make sure you do. those skins can be swapped out, covers, oh, the wraps. Yes, and they'll be wiped down and uh, be treated in a way that will be um, harder to do graffiti on them. Right, but they can be replaced. Yes. Okay. Yep. Interesting. That's cool. great. Very good. Any public testimony on this item? We have one individual sign up, Mary Seip. Come on up, Mary. Great presentation. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Lene. Good morning. My name is Mary Seip. Um, I really support this, and I encourage the City Council to accept this donation. I think it's a great idea, um, and I want to thank Clean and Safe for the work that they do. Um, I just cannot believe that between 2015 and 2018 that the we went from 485 tons to 724 tons of trash. Um, that tells me a couple of things. Um, one is that uh, we're a wasteful society. Um, the, the packaging uh, that manufacturers use uh, is just excessive and unnecessary, and I think we need to start uh, maybe leaning in the direction of trying to reduce the amount of trash in the first place. Uh, uh, it's great that we increase the amount of trash receptacles, but uh, I think we really need to start focusing on reducing the trash in the first place. And um, uh, I, having grown up in, in the Portland metropolitan area, I look back to how we used to be the cleanest city in the nation. And we took great pride in that. And if you walk around our city today, it's not what it used to be. And I remember, I think there were signs that said, keep Oregon beautiful or, or something like that. Green, yeah, yeah, that were everywhere. And so I would encourage that maybe we start doing some kind of campaign. Um, I, I, I'm so discouraged. Uh, this weekend I was sitting at a Starbucks uh, uh, in the downtown. And I was sitting there. I watched two people walking down the street literally walk past a trash can and throw their trash on the sidewalk. One person was unwrapping something, and as he walked down the block, he would throw, unwrap, throw, unwrap, throw, unwrap, all the way down the block. And so I think we also, you know, we need to start having some sense of personal responsibility in our society and having a conscience. And the next time I see somebody do that, I'm going to jump up out of my seat at Starbucks, and I'm going to run across the street, and I'm going to pick up their trash, and I'm going to tell them to pick up their trash. Um, it, it's time for us to take some responsibility as citizens for keeping our city clean and safe. And um, I just had to say that. Yeah, Thank Mary, and, and I can relate to that. A couple of years ago, I watched somebody take a coffee cup and dump it on the ground at a stoplight. So I got out of my car, What's up picked it up, and handed it to him. And I realized as soon as I handed it to him, I'd made a terrible mistake because I actually thought he might shoot me. I know. Um, he was really irate about it. Um, that being said, I agree with you, and I, I think this ordinance is important. The fact that it's a partnership with the business community makes a lot of sense. There's, there's a mutual interest here. Um, but getting back to your larger point, you know, it, it wasn't that long ago that I started commuting to Salem as state treasurer, and I actually enjoyed my commute for a lot of reasons. But over the course of the six years that I was state treasurer, the amount of trash and litter along I-5 all the way between Portland and Salem increased dramatically. And I mean, I, I remember you know, a time where if you threw garbage out of your car, you dropped something on the ground, I mean, you know, li little white vans would pull up and people would get out in hazmat suits with picker uppers and they'd, they'd collect it. It just wasn't done. It was part of the ethos to keep our community clean. It is not part of our ethos today and we need to reinvest in that. 
And this program, it may seem small, but it's actually, I think, going to make a big difference. The fact that we're able to start now moving community-wide with the program, thanks to the generosity of Clean and Safe and the work of BPS, uh, there's a real opportunity here to get that ethos back. And I, I agree, we probably should do something around a community campaign again. They, yeah, they I, seem a little bit, um, you know, we, we've been exposed to a lot of campaigns over the years, but it did work. Yeah, and, it was very you know, I'm, effective. I'm mindful of the case of, of Texas, and sorry to go on, but this, this is a really important issue, and I, I want people to know, we get hundreds of calls about trash in our office over the course of maybe every week <coughs> or two, hundreds of calls about it. People saying just what you do, that, that what's going on here? Um, Texas couldn't figure out why there were so many cigarette butts on the sides of their roads. And they tried all kinds of things like, please you know, use your ashtray, please clean up the garbage. And they realized that the demographic that was actually <laughs> largely responsible, uh, and hint, people a lot like me, um, throwing cigarette butts out of the car. I don't smoke, by the way. But um, they found out that that messaging just didn't work, the please do this, please do that. Don't mess with Texas. And having you know, some Dallas Cowboy stars saying, don't mess with Texas. And then all of a sudden, you started to see a lot of bumper stickers on pickup trucks and other vehicles saying don't mess with Texas, all of a sudden it worked. And so you just gotta find that right, you know, how do you, how, how do you really uh, connect with people, particularly those who are maybe like the ones you're describing where they're just walking down the street being super careless about what they're doing. We, we've gotta get that ethos back. Mayor, can I just add Commissioner one Fish. You know, Mary, you're, um, we're sort of channeling, I think, of a figure in history that was very noted for this, which was Lyndon Johnson's wife, Lady Bird Johnson, and she was part of that Keep right. America Beautiful movement and keeping the parks clean, and, and it was something that she framed and talked about. Uh, since we're talking about anecdotes that bother us, I will say that I, I had an all-time low the other day when I was riding my bike on the Vera Katz Esplanade, and it had been a weekend in which Solve had gone in to do a cleanup, which is wonderful. And they do what they always do, which is they then pile the garbage next to a garbage can to be picked up. And in the interval between piling it and the pickup, people had come along and opened it up and scattered all the garbage all over the place. And it just, it ought to be, you know, some things, you know, you could, the idea that you could cure that by through education or a sign or something, there's just some things you shouldn't have to like, we shouldn't have to remind people that's not, that's not okay. Yeah. And it completely undid basically the benefit of what volunteers did in collecting the, gra the garbage. So I hope, uh, I see it a lot, because uh, I walk around downtown a lot more than I used to. I see it with people that um, buy fast food, and then they're, on the, they're getting ready to leave on the street corner, and they just leave their trash in the street. I just, I just don't know what gets into someone, and I'm not even gonna mention you know, predominant license plates that I see associated with this act, but it's just I can't believe that people would do that. Yeah, it's, it's, such it's, disrespect. it's a moral issue. It really is. And, and I, I look at it sometimes and I think, um, you know, some of it I'm sure is my uh, Catholic uh, school guilt, <laughs> Catholic girl guilt. But I just, I cannot throw something away. It, it just, you know, it, it's just an inherent thing. Like I'm going to be struck by lightning if I do it, you know. So anyhow, this, this is a good thing. Great. Thank you. Sue, please call the roll. Fish. Well, thank you, Downtown Clean and Safe, for your leadership. Um, thrilled to hear that we're going to uh, negotiate for a seventh day pickup, because I think Sundays have now become a significant issue. And um, really exciting to see um, the way that you've in incorporated art into the design. And um, so thank you for your great partnership, I. Salsman. Uh, I want to thank uh, Clean and Safe, Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, the Business Alliance for uh, caring so much about trash downtown. Uh, you know, and I do think some of the anecdotes we're, we're talking about uh, do emanate from the fact that I don't think we have enough trash cans in our city. Uh, and I'll use my gold standard, which is New York City. I mean, it is 
you can't find a block face that doesn't have at least one trash can on it. And I think that's we, that needs to be our gold standard too. We need to have more. I appreciate all the work going on, but we need more of them. And that, I think that's why some people are just too blame too blame lazy to walk another block and find that trash can that is there. But and that's why we need to have more of them. I. You daily. Uh, well, thank you. I'm I'm particularly excited about the. Um, replaceable wraps and all the possibilities that that holds and just want to reiterate what Commissioner Saltzman said um, this is a big issue in in all of our business districts really and it ble often bleeds over into the neighborhoods so um, I'm adding it to my to-do list <laughs> I Fritz I'm very grateful to Clean and Safe, and particularly to Central City Concern and their staff who do such great work. I um, very much appreciate how clean they keep our downtown. It's interesting because just this morning I was walking um, past the bus stop on Hawthorne, where the, or, or rather on Madison, where there's a trash can right there, and uh, saw a coffee cup on the floor within literally five steps of the next trash can on the next corner by City Hall. So people just need to be more respectful. Why should somebody else have to pick up your coffee cup? Um, I, I don't get it. And so in the meantime, while they're not, maybe the rest of us just picking up their stuff and putting it in the right place would um, lead by example in getting people to do the right thing. And thank you very much for your partnership. I. Wheeler. So here is one more great example of how the business community is partnering with the uh, uh, Portland City government. I'm very pleased with this arrangement. Clean and Safe has been a valuable contributor to our community for many, many years. The Portland Business Alliance has been an important partner to us as recently as a few days ago when we took our first vote on our budget. Um, I think this is a great program. Uh, and I agree with Commissioner Saltzman, and I agree with where I think Lene is headed with this as well. Uh, this is a great program. It's proven in terms of its results. It is supported by the public. I really appreciate the attention to the aesthetic nature of these new receptacles. I think they look really great, really fun, and very Portland-esque. Uh, so thank you for that. We look forward to strengthening and expanding the program in the years ahead, hopefully through continued partnership with Clean and Safe. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Colleagues, I need to take a one-minute recess. Just one minute.
fourth session. Just a reminder that the record is closed and no further testimony will be accepted. Sue, can you please read both items 538 and item 539? 538, adopt the Central City 2035 plan, amend the comprehensive plan, comprehensive plan map, transportation system plan, Willamette Greenway plan, scenic resources protection plan, zoning map, and Title 33. Authorize adoption of administration rules, repeal and replace prior central city plans and documents. Very, oops, sorry. 539, amend the central city plan district of the zoning code to increase bonus heights and impose master plan requirements in certain river place sub areas. Very good, Sally, do you wanna go ahead and kick us off today? Yes, thank you very much. So on May 24th, council took a number of actions to move Central City 2035 uh, toward final adoption. Uh, but there are a few additional items that we need to accomplish today to prepare us for that final vote on June 6th. Um, all of the items uh, today relate to the requirement for a shadow study adjacent to parks and open spaces. One relates to the main ordinance and one to the River Place ordinance. Um, and then I understand Commissioner Fritz has uh, an amendment or two that she'd like to introduce. Uh, so you have a packet in front of you dated um, May 30th, uh, 2018, revised, and that contains these amendments. Um, also, just as a reminder, all 25 boxes of the legal record are in the balcony today. Um, so thank well, you so for, much. First of all, I hope the balcony holds up. Um, and I will get to Commissioner Fritz's amendment or amendments in just a moment, but I'd like to begin today by withdrawing my motion on what we referred to as technical amendment nine to the main central city 2035 ordinance, and that was from the May 24th meeting. Uh, and the reason for that is that staff has a new, simpler proposal to address the shadow study that we identified. And I understand, Rachel, you're gonna describe the new amendment, is that correct? Yes, thank you. Rachel Hoy with the Bureau thank of Planning you. and Sustainability. So the um, amendment on the table, uh, as mentioned, um, through the Central City 2035 plan, We've added more parks and open spaces that will require we be required to conduct a shadow study. This came out of the West Quadrant planning process. Uh, the the requirement was ex expanded north of Burnside. Um, since the 80s, we've had the requirement along the park blocks, and so we looked throughout the West Quadrant and. Um, from that public process, it was determined expanding the requirement um, to other parks and open spaces uh, would be valuable. So what this amendment does is it clarifies that the um, requirement applies to properties with both base and bonus height. So we, we needed to add the requirement to both maps. We have two new um, height maps. We have a base height map and a bonus height map. So that's part of the requirement um, to add it to those maps. Um, and as I said, it's also um, to apply it to properties that have both uh, just a base height and those properties that also have um, base plus a bonus height. The changes we've made also confirm that the shadow analysis um, is adjustable. And uh, we've added some language to confirm as well that um, you cannot adjust um, heights on your map. So base heights are prohibited from being adjusted and bonus heights are prohibited from being adjusted. And the code has read that before. This was just clarifying and confirming um, by clearly noting in the code um, what's adjustable and what's not. Very good. Uh, I move this amendment, which includes Amended commentary code and maps is shown in the May 30th, 2018 BPS memo, which everybody should have in front of them. Second. And we have a second from Commissioner Saltzman. Any discussion on this item? I'm sorry, is this the whole of this packet that you just gave me? I'm sorry? Is this the all of this whole packet that I just got? Yes, so the packet here, starting on page three, um, at the bottom of the page, it's the full, I should have mentioned, it's the full height section, which is quite a bit of code, but we've grayed, we've highlighted the few areas where 
um, the changes needed to be made um, that I just mentioned, as well as the height maps are included in the packet, which reflect um, those changes. So, Commissioner Fritz, if I may, I think if you're trying to clarify, I believe it's pages three through 15 of the packet that you have, so it's amendment um, A of that packet, which is sponsored by the mayor, not amendment B, which is on the last page of, or page 16 of the packet. And, and I, I was obviously focused on something else. Is, okay. Have I had this before? This is an update to um, the amendment number nine that uh, <laughs> Mayor Wheeler referred to. Staff, um, as that's been uh, removed, this is a replacement. Um, we've simplified it and we've highlighted for you the areas and the maps where um, the code needed to be updated to apply the shadow study to properties with base heights as well as properties with bonus heights. But all, all of this that's underlined, have I, I've seen that before, the only new part the sh is the shaded. That's correct. Everything that's underlined, yes, it has been in um, the uh, draft, the recommended draft that has been before council. Okay, thank you. Well, right, okay. Sue, could you please call the roll? Fish. Aye. Saltzman. Aye. Udaley. Aye. Fritz. Aye. Wheeler. Hi, amendments adopted. Uh, now moving on, I understand Commissioner Fritz has an amendment or amendments. I do, and I understand that Rachel has part of it to, call, to hand out for me the language. Yes. And then cool. these are the shadow studies that the Bureau has wrapped together for me. Uh, and each, each person gets one packet? Yeah. Okay, there's one extra here. Thank you. Thank you. And I have a copy for the record, Sue. So this is uh, with respect to the Chi Lansu Chinese Garden that was discussed last week. And um, my previous amendment was to say that for Lansu Chinese Garden, the adjustments to the shade study are prohibited. And I would like to withdraw that amendment because it's absolutely meaningless. Um, the shading of the Lansu Chinese Garden isn't at the particular times that um, are specified in the rest of the code. If you look at um, the smaller uh, document showing the, st the shade studies at 4 p.m. on June 21st and 5 p.m. on June 21st, particularly 5 p.m. on June 21st. So if you, so if you could just put this forward, uh, have this so that the cameras can oh. see it, please. Can you make it so that I... So I'm withdrawing this amendment that's on the screen right now. Because none of those... Uh, no. Can you take this, the PowerPoint down so that the camera is on? Oh, I'm sorry. Fritz? Of course. Of course. Yeah. So that's the amendment I'm withdrawing because adjustments being prohibited doesn't make a hill of beans because there isn't any shadow at those particular times. The challenge is for the garden that uh, the shadow from the new building is at four and five and six o'clock, um, with the most shadow being at five o'clock. So yes, I know it's open until seven o'clock, but if it's okay at five o'clock, it'll be okay at seven o'clock. Um, so that's why I have a new amendment, which you just got, did you? Yes. Um, and that is for the shadow study to basically be the same as before, except adding, uh, limiting the shadow analysis to 20% of the adjacent open space at any hour of the day, June 21st and September 21st. And you'll notice that I have not made this um, with adjustments being prohibited. So um, somebody who wanted to shade the garden more than 20% um, at any time of the day could come to council or could ask the Historic Landmarks Commission and the uh, council to do that. And Commissioner Fritz, if I just may, um, to clarify, uh, everything that's shaded here under um, the, the standard that Commissioner Fritz has passed out, it's just C1A, uh, which Comm Commissioner Fritz read, which is the new information. Everything else that is shaded is the same as the uh, existing um, dates and times. 
So could I get a second to my amendment, please? I'll, I'll second it for discussion <laughs> purposes, but I, I have a bunch of questions about this. Um, first, first of all, are, are we looking at 200 feet here in this picture? What are we looking at? Yes, that's 200 feet. Okay, and currently, under current zoning, what is allowed? 415, that was for the last four, several years okay, we have been so working we, to we, make sure that the uh, heights were consistent with the historic district and with not shading the Chinese garden. Okay, so I'm looking at the shadow analysis <clears throat> that you sent around yesterday and it shows 200 feet, it shows 160 feet, and on these analyses there's really no difference that I can see between 160 feet and 200 feet. Correct, it's very difficult, very little. So, because the issue is it's not shaded at three o'clock, which is what's currently specified in the code. The issue is it's shaded at four o'clock and five o'clock. Okay, so here's my question. Do we have the, is one of these, do we have a picture for 160 feet versus the 200 at this particular time scenario? So the- Because there's very little difference on the other scenarios. I'm wondering how significant the difference is on this scenario. Uh, we did not do the four and five o'clock for 160 feet. We just were trying to get at least one version of that done. So we went with 200, which is what was on the table. Uh, it would be less than what you see, but um, we don't know the exact percentages. But we it would still cast shade. Yes. At that particular hour on that date. Yes, if you, if you look at the analysis that uh, uh, we provided earlier at 3 p.m. on it's March, let me get to the right one. Excuse me. September 21st at 3 p.m. Uh, 160 feet she does 10 percent. Um, so, but we did not do, um, uh, and 200 feet uh, does 12 percent. Okay. So, so and, and if I could just ask a follow-up question, and I'll, I'll cede to Commissioner Fish. Um, in our conversations, you had indicated you created a worst-case scenario on this block. Could you explain what you meant by that? Yes, if, I believe you all have copies of these sort of massing diagrams. Um, that, where we put the tower on that block um, is in the southeast corner. So if you're trying to cast shade on something adjacent, uh, south and east are where you're gonna have your most impactful shadows. And we put it there because the west side of that block is where the contributing structures are. So when we originally started this analysis, we were trying to think, Let's give it height and see how much you can build, protect the park, but also create the opportunity maybe to preserve those structures. You could conceivably, like is proposed on block 33, push all the height to the west and it would cast less shadows to the west, or to the east, sorry, onto the land zoo. Well, I have two questions, Joe. One, I'm, I'm, I'm a little more, I'm sort of somewhat familiar with this discussion um, in the context of what we did at Bug Clark Commons, because the, 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 um, the building could have been on Broadway or on the back side of the lot, and there was a question about where, where you put it to maximize urban form. Uh, putting the return on investment aside for a second is, is is there a stronger argument to put it on the west side to maintain urban form along that corridor? Or is there just as much an argument that it be on the east side now that we have given height increases uh, to the four adjacent blocks to you, 33? You, yeah, Commissioner, um, uh, putting it on the west side puts it close to places where we've already built tall buildings. So that's you know um, responsive to that and sort of mitigates or pushes, lowers the height, which is a problem for us on the parts of the block where its adjacent uh, frontages are shorter. Uh, you know, we just adopted uh, design guidelines for Chinatown. I'm not really sure. This is just a massing. This is not a building. I haven't thought about. We haven't examined that in detail. What would happen with the amendment is um, a building proposed on this site and two other sites would go to the Landmarks Commission in this case because the block is in uh, the historic district. Uh, the Landmarks Commission would apply those guidelines that we 
just adopted. Uh, the Landmarks Commission would also examine uh, the shadow analysis, which is a standard that uh, exists separately from the design guidelines. Um, at 20%, uh, if a building was going to, uh, at any time during the day, um, it's very, for a 200 foot building for sure, um, the Landmarks Commission is going to have to give an adjustment of some sort, um, probably. Uh, we just don't know because we haven't done all the different permutations. Um, and they have the ability to adjust that standard. And what that means is they're going to say it doesn't meet the 20% shading standard, but it does these things that we feel mitigate that somehow. And on balance with the other uh, um, guidelines and things we're trying to accomplish in the district, we can accept this adjustment to 25%, say, for instance. That's the level of adjustment that you're usually talking about. Um, so that's what would happen. And if that was not acceptable uh, as a result to the applicant, it would be appealed and it would come to you all because it would be a type three permit and you would all have the same discussion. So the one thing it doesn't, like the, the question we have that is inherent in the proposition that uh, Commissioner Fritz has put on the table is that there's a level of shading on Land Sioux Gardens that's acceptable to us and it's less than 75% at 3 p.m. on those dates. But, and uh, Commissioner Fritz is proposing it's 20%. But we haven't objectively looked at that one way or the other to say what's the right number. We haven't objectively looked at it to say What's the impact on the development around it? Like how big of a building could you build under that standard? Um, because in part, we would want to give both the Landmarks Commission and uh, the City Council a sense of what to base your decision down the road on how much shading to allow. What would you base that on? You know, 20%, it can't meet, 75% uh, is too much, where's the right spot? So um, that work has not been done. But that's the principle that's embedded in uh, Commissioner Fritz's amendment. Mayor. Sorry. Commissioner Daly. Um, well, Joe, thank you for that explanation. I'm somewhat relieved that um, you are not prepared to extrapolate backwards from this restriction and tell us what kind of building we could build, because um, I'm not either. And that, that would be my number one question. Um, I want to make it clear that I'm very committed to protecting the garden. I can't imagine a scenario where city council um, would be willing to sacrifice such a valuable asset and a community um, amenity and a cultural landmark. I'm not concerned with the impact on the property owner or developer as much as I'm concerned with affording the Landmarks Commission the flexibility that, that they need to um, allow the best scenario possible for the garden and for the adjoining blocks or block. And Commissioner, that's why I am at that not making it adjustments prohibited. Joe, can I ask you two questions? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, really, the only reason we're having this conversation, I think, is that last week, <coughs> clock struck midnight, we extended the height increase to adjacent parcels. And on, on the, the diagram we have, in, and I'm, I guess I'm a little confused, what are the parcels that now get the additional height in addition to Menashe? What are the four parcels that are in play? Um, four parcels. The, um, the, uh, the, four blocks. the shadow analysis um, applies to uh, properties on the west, the southwest, and the south side of the park you're trying to protect. Right because that's where the shadows come from in our part of the globe. You don't go one block, you don't, you don't go one. We don't do the east, we don't the, do the north. So, but what, what are the, can you just tell me off of this diagram that we have, which are the blocks that we extended the additional height to? Um, the, oh, the additional height is just extended to the block with the red tower, Mayor, uh, uh, Commissioner, and it's the whole block though. Uh, and if you look at, um, uh, page page two. two of your packet, 
uh, you're going to see uh, a block, a full, a full uh, from third to fifth. It's four, it's four blocks there. I'm sorry, I was mis uh, misunderstanding your question. Right. It's from third to fifth, from Everett to Gleason. Those four blocks get 200 feet. Um, the, th the blocks that are adjacent to Lansu, uh, amongst those blocks, the only one that would uh, be trigger the shade analysis is the block at third and Everett. Um, uh, and then also, though, if you're looking at that map on page two, you see that the shading is applied to the southwest corner uh, and to the southern edge uh, of Lansu. We do shade analysis for all of those, too. Those are limited to 100 feet, and we did the analysis, and uh, they, it would be hard for them not to uh, pass the standard. So, so we think that it works for those properties. It's really the third and Everett block. That's the issue. And, and if, if, if at some point in the future, Mr. Menashe decides to develop his lot, at this point, I think he would be, would be perfectly understandable if he just sold a lot and moved to Hawaii. But if he did, did choose to develop his lot, it, comes, it would likely uh, raise issues at historic landmarks. Those could come to us. Could we, at that point, as a condition of approval, modify the, the, um, the shadow analysis? Stuff? Yes. Yeah, the, the, the same sort of set of considerations um, on appeal and, uh, uh, that the Landmarks Commission considered would come to you all. You all would be the judges in that case, like you just So we'd were have another certain. bite at the apple if we chose to set, go with the mayor's amendment and, and later um, uh, evaluated what, if assuming something came to us uh, on appeal, evaluated uh, that recommendation uh, based on things like um, shadow analysis. I, I believe you would. Um, the uh, the building would um, the your grounds for doing it would be a little less, but I believe that you would still have the ability to um, affect the design of the building. See, technically, if it was uh, uh, set to seventy five percent and three p.m. those two dates. Um, what our analysis shows is that you can design a 200-foot building and it'll meet that standard. The 20% standard at any time during the day, uh, it's not going to be able to meet that, and you're going to have to give it an adjustment. That is that making sense? That's all. Yeah. Yeah. So the intent the intent is let's preserve the sunlight in our lovely Lansu Chinese Garden in the evenings all summer long. Very good. Any further discussion? We have a motion and a second. Sue, please call the roll. Fish. No. Saltzman? No. You Daly? No. Fritz? Aye. Uh, Wheeler? No. The motion fails. Uh, Commissioner Saltzman, this is where you take a walk. Oh, okay. Next up, we need to amend the River Place Ordinance to replace one of the maps to ensure that the shadow study amendments that we just adopted remain in place. Rachel, would you like to briefly explain this? Yes, this is um, the uh, amendment that the mayor uh, moved forward previously and you all voted for. Um, we just need to replace one of the maps from the River Place Ordinance to make sure it's not undone, um, uh, the amendment that you just moved. Uh, so that's the extent of this. It's, um, I'm showing the map here. It's map th um, three of three. Sorry. It's not the right one. Um, I want to get to the right slide here. Oh. Well, it's map three of three of map 510-4, and in your packet, that is on page 17. Very good. Do I have a second? Second. We have a second from Commissioner Fish. Any further discussion? Sue, could you please call the roll? Fish. Aye. Udaly? Aye. It's Wheeler. Aye. 
Okay, that uh, amendment passes. We'll be back on June 6th to take the final vote on the Central City 2035 plan ordinances and resolutions. That concludes the Central City 2035 matter for today. Next item will be, we go to the regular agenda. Um, just before you move on. I Commissioner just, Fritz. Thank you. I'd just like to thank uh, Joe Zender, Rachel Hoy, Sally, Ed Sally Edmonds, and Mark Azanis for all your work on this over the last week. I, I really appreciate it. Also, um, Sp Brandon Spencer Hartle and Hilary Adam on the Historic Landmarks Commission. Um, nice try. Very good. Uh, next up is uh, 556. Item 556, appoint Bonnie Yee Yosik, Katie Holland, and Tamara Layden, and reappoint Tanya Booker and Ian Jaquis to the Portland Parks Board for our terms to expire June 30, 2021. Before we uh, move forward with Commissioner Fritz on this, we have some kids in the chamber. Where are you all from? Jason Lee, excellent, and what grade? Jason! All right, excellent. Welcome to Portland City Hall. Are you enjoying your tour? Yeah. yeah. Awesome, great, we're glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Fish, uh, Fritz, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, I am very Bucks happy in to introduce this item. I don't know if we have uh, staff or any of our um, honored guests here. Apparently not. Um, this is to appoint three new members to the Portland Parks Board and to reappoint two. Thank you very much to Judy Blueworth Skelton, Kathy Vong Stevens, and Krista Stout for their service, and they are now term limited out. And thank you, Bonnie G. Yosek, Katie Holland, and Tamara Layden for taking on this new and exciting responsibility. Um, I'll just give you a, a brief bio of each of them. Um, Bonnie G. Yosek is an accomplished economic and policy analysis with over 23 years of experience conducting economic, demographic, fiscal, and land use analyses for public and private sectors clients, including state and local governments, corporations, individual property owners, developments organizations, and other professional service firms. She started Bonnie G. Yosek LLC, a woman and minority owned business specializing in economic and policy analysis in 2001. She is committed to a uh, range of community service activities. She's currently serving on the board of Portland's Farmers Market as Professor Emer President Emeritus of the Oregon Wellesley Club, former lead volunteer for Beverly Cleary School's active transportation program, and volunteering to foster guide dogs training for Occupores Guide Dog Association. Uh, Katie Holland is a native of Southeast Portland, enrolled member of the Confederated Tribes of the Silex Indians. Katie has worked with the Silex Tribe in Silex Tribe, sorry, in Portland for over 20 years as their Portland office. Katie has been serving Native adults, families, and youth to access to access access services in the areas of education, job training, employment, and cultural programming. Katie's first love has been working with youth. She has worked with Portland Public Schools, tutoring children in reading. As a softball and soccer coach, opened the Silette's Tribe's first Portland Head Start program, and in the last 15 years has worked with numerous Native youth programs who serve Native American youth, providing mentorship, guidance, and enrichment programs and activities. She is a graduate of Portland State University and served on Portland State University's Native American Student and Community Center Board. And uh, Tamara Layden is a scientist born and raised in the Pacific Northwest. She is an avid backpacker, hiker, and climber, and investigates every new area. She graduated from Oregon State University with BS in zoology to pursue her passion for the outdoors and the wildlife. Since then, she's been building her understanding of the challenges Portland faces, especially as they relate to the connection between the environmental movement and racial equity. As such, she has become more engaged in her community and leadership opportunities that aim to develop her skills as a person of color in her field. She currently works at Reed College as a research assistant in a biology lab and is continually looking for ways to encourage diversity in uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, and the outdoors. Very good. These seem like excellent appointees. I'll take that as a motion, Commissioner Fritz. Second. 
We have a second from Commissioner Fish. Any further discussion? Sue, would you please call the roll? Fish. Aye. Salsman. Aye. Udaly. Aye. Fritz. It's truly amazing that great volunteers like this, and, in, and also Tonya Booker and Ian Jaquist, who have provided great service, are willing to continue volunteering their time to serve Portland Parks and Recreation. Thank you so much. Aye. Wheeler. It's a great board. Thank you for your service, and thank you for those of you who are continuing your service. We're greatly appreciative. I vote aye. The report's accepted. Next item, 557, is the second reading. 557. Extend grant agreements by one year and provide additional grant funding not to exceed $350,000 in aggregate with seven organizations providing services to youth in partnership with Portland Parks and Rec. As a second reading, this is an item that's been previously discussed. There's been a presentation and public testimony taken. Please call the roll. Fish. Uh, aye. Salsman. Aye. Udaly. Aye. Fritz. Aye. Wheeler. Aye, the ordinance is adopted. Next item, 558, also a second reading. Five five eight. Amend fee schedules for tree permits. Please call the roll. Fish. Aye. Salsman? Aye. Udaly? Aye. Fritz? Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Please call item five five nine. Five five nine. Vacate a portion of Southeast Grant Street, west of Southeast Water Avenue, subject to certain conditions and reservations. Commissioner Saltzman. I'll turn it over to our staff person for updates or briefing what we need to know. Good morning. Thank you. Uh... Good morning. Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, this is a street vacation um, initiated by uh, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, known as OMSI, uh, which owns the adjacent property. And I believe we have, we may have a map available if Sue can help me with our PowerPoint. While Sue's working on um, that, kids, where are you from? Uh, we're from Jason Lee. Also from Jason oh. Lee. That's correct. Welcome. Are you enjoying your tour? All right. Well, welcome to Portland City Council. Good morning. Thank, thanks to all the teachers and parent chaperones. Uh, above and beyond the call of Jesus. <laughs> Definitely. All right. Well, I can continue with uh, a few comments. So the, the vacation uh, was initiated uh, to consolidate uh, property since OMSI owns uh, the property adjacent to this little uh, stub of um, Grant Street. Um, on the map, you can see the, uh, the yellow highlight is the little piece of Grant Street that is uh, left over from previous uh, replattings and street vacations. And you can see OMSI to the uh, west there and the, the New Water Avenue. And um, this is the uh, Tillicum Crossing landing uh, with the Max Station. And then this is the, uh, the streetcar uh, platform coming down this way. And so OMSI owns this um, parcel of land, and so the uh, uh, vacating that street, um, um, to our knowledge and OMSI's understanding, that piece of land will attach to OMSI's land. Uh, PVOT requested the usual comments from uh, city bureaus and other agencies. Uh, we didn't receive any objections. Um, OMSI did receive a letter of support from the Hosford Abernethy Neighborhood uh, District uh, last year. Uh, the Planning Sustainability Commission uh, reviewed and recommended approval of the uh, proposal um, in February of this year. Uh, the Bureau of Environmental Services did request a uh, sewer tunnel easement um, over the property. This is a close-up, and then the, uh, the tunnel easement is over part of the vacation area because the east side big pipe runs north-south um, through this area, and so BES um, uh, requires that uh, easement um, to protect uh, their pipe. Um, the tunnel in this uh, location is 100 feet deep, but still BES wanted um, the easement um, over the surface. Um, uh, the tunnel easement has already been negotiated and signed by OMSI and BES, and so it's um, basically ready to go if the vacation is approved. 
I'll be happy to answer any questions. Colleagues? I'm, I'm, just, fish. I'm just curious, um, if OMSI intends to develop that property, what, what is the effect of the BES easement? Is it, does it limit what they can build on top of that portion, or does it just require that the easement be recorded? Uh, the easement will be recorded, and honestly, I do not know. You know, normal BES easements restrict um, construction on top, and since this is so deep, I believe they may allow some surface use of the area. Um, I mean, my recollection, and Commissioner Salzman is probably more of an authority on this, but um, the Bureau, I think, has attempted to preserve access to the big pipe. Like if there's some failure or some problem, sometimes they've got to get access from uh, ground level. Then there's the issue about is the, is the ground stable? You've said it's 100 feet down, so that doesn't seem to be an issue. Th this sounds right. more like form over substance, acknowledging that there's something underneath but not necessarily impacting the development. Right. I mean, I think OMSI reserves the right to use the property, um, but BES would need to be known because depending upon what was constructed there, obviously if somebody was going to build, you know, a 400-foot tower there, that might impact the tunnel more than a one-level building. And so I think BES will at least need notice about what would be constructed and, um, and presumably, consult. Presumably they could modify the easement if, 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 it, if they concluded that the development did not adversely impact the big pipe. Right. Okay, thank you. Very good. Any further commentary? Any public testimony on this item, Sue? No, well, excuse me, no one signed up. Very good, this is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you. Next item, 560. 560, create a local improvement district to construct street, sidewalk, stormwater, and sanitary sewer improvements in the Northeast 55th through 57th Avenues and Killingsworth Street Local Improvement District. Commissioner Saltzman. We'll turn it over to Andrew Abbey. Very good, good morning. Thank Andrew. you, Commissioner Saltzman. So you've seen this uh, Local Improvement District before, so I don't have a PowerPoint for you this morning, uh, but for the benefit of the mayor who is not with us on April 25th, I just want to note that the major change that we have made as we put forth a new LID proposal that improves not only 57th Avenue, but also parallel 55th Avenue to more evenly distribute the local traffic in the neighborhood. And we notified the property owners within um, basically every, everybody from Killingworth down to Prescott on 57th, what we were doing as well as around 55th and Emerson. We only got one remonstrance. Um, which I'm recommending that council overrule and by adopting this ordinance, you will be overruling the remonstrance. Um, it can't go without passing that um, this discussion with the community daylighted some important issues and I really appreciate the feedback that I got from the community and I think one of the takeaways here is that we need to at times look at doing uh, parallel streets or concentrating on a sub area of Cully as opposed to just doing one street in isolation and then expecting that street to handle the traffic. Um, the other thing I just wanted to note with respect to the remonstrance is um, we have brought a lot of FTC funding to this project and the rate that we're proposing for the property owners when you subtract out the payment for right of way cost is only about 4% above the rate that we offered about seven years ago for a then PEC subsidized project in Lentz. So the reason that the assessments are a little higher is just because we've got some large frontages here. And um, with that, I just have a housekeeping item that um, I noticed that the Exhibit A that got filed was a draft version, which is the assessment register. We're not proposing to change any of the assessments for the property owners. I emailed through the correct version of the Exhibit A assessment register. City attorneys advised that we can uh, amend that based on the electronic copy, and if that meets with the pleasure of the council, if we could adopt that amendment. So um, moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Sue, can you call the roll? Fish. Aye. Salsman? Aye. Udaley? Aye. Fritz? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The amendment's adopted. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. 
very good. This is a first reading of a non-emergent. I'm sorry, I should ask if there's any testimony. I apologize. And we did have uh, Danielle Walker has signed up to testify. Very good. Come on up. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, I just have a few comments. So hi, my name is Danielle Walker. I am one of the homeowners included in the LID along 57th. I was also uh, the family that did submit the remonstrance. Um, and I'll go into a little bit about why we chose to do that again this time. Um, thanks for the opportunity to address you all again um, on this really important issue for my family. I also want to thank Mr. Abbey for his patience and collaboration with us over the past six months. This has been a long process for all of us. Um, Andrew and I have spent many hours together on the phone discussing this project, and I have no doubt of his dedication to this work. So, thank you. Um, so, just to start off, I just wanted to share that um, we were actually surprised by PDOT's, PBOT's continuation of the development <coughs> of the LID along 57th, given the level of remonstrance received in our original proposal. Um, if you have not done so already, I would encourage you to read chapters 9-403 and 17.08.060 of the city code for more on that. So your positions hold enormous power and influence in our lives. Your decision to approve this project will force my family to pay the city $44,000 before any interest is applied. Um, and I just wanna note that we've been told that this has the anomaly that they aren't generally this high, it's because we have a very long frontage of property. But just this morning, we heard um, another public testimony from someone else who actually had a uh, LID being proposed that I think he said was $45,000. So I just, was eye-opening for me to know that this perhaps is not um, the exception to the rule for these projects. So, um, according to the latest report by the Portland Housing Bureau, the annual median income for a family of four in the Portland area is just over $80,000. For the average Portland home, this means that being forced to take on a debt of over 50% of their annual income. Do you believe forcing the size of debt on a homeowner is reasonable? Do you believe that this aligns with your political platforms of creating affordable living in Portland? For me, the approval of this LID comes with a heavy dose of irony as you spread your social, social media messages of affordable and equitable living. For the future, I ask, sorry, I lost my spot. For the future, I ask that city consider limits on the amount of money the city can force a homeowner to pay towards these projects. 50% of what a family makes in a year is simply too much to bear, regardless of the loan options that may be offered. I fully acknowledge the positive outcomes of this project. Being a Cully resident myself, I am in full support of improving the safety and connectivity of the Cully neighborhood. I very much believe that everyone involved in this process shares a common goal. I believe, I also believe the homeowner, I also believe, however, that lower cost options that result in an equal level of safety have been wholly ignored in order to meet budget deadlines and political pressures. Project managers at PBOT have shared with us their opinion that lower cost alternatives do exist. Given that the city and Habitat are each contributing hundreds of thousands of dollars for this effort, it seems most prudent to explore all alternatives rather than moving forward with the highest cost option. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Any further discussion, colleagues? Very good, this is the first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading as amended. Thank you, Andrew. Next item, 561, this is a second reading. Revised transportation fees, rates, and charges for fiscal year 2018, 19, and fix an effective rate. Please date. call the roll. Fish. Aye. Salzman. Aye. Udaly. Aye. Fritz. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. Ordinance is adopted. 562, please. 562. Amend code pertaining to private for hire transportation in the city. Uh, this is a second reading. Please call the roll. Fish. Aye. Salzman. Aye. Udaly. Aye. 
Prince? I'm very glad that we're making these improvements during this study. Thank you, Commissioner Saltzman, for your leadership on this. Uh, thank you to everybody in the community who cares so much about this. And I'm glad that we're going to get the reports back in six months that we're establishing at the board. I think that's, we already did that last week. Um, and that we are finally going to get the wheelchair access vehicles going. Thank you very much, Nicole Sharon, for your work on that. And everybody at PBOT, thank you. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next item, 563. 563, authorize an intergovernmental agreement with Home Forward for an annual amount of $640,000 to assist Sorry. City of Portland utility customers that encounter barriers in paying water and sewer services. This is a second reading. Please call the roll. Fish. Um, I just want to repeat a few things I said last week. Um, this is a good day for cost burden renters. And I'm proud to be on a council that has chosen to invest wisely in expanding uh, a nationally known utility assistance program, uh, the benefits of that program to not just homeowners, but renters. Colleagues, about three in 10 utilities in this country offer some kind of discount program. And about three or four cities have been working on an approach similar to ours of extending the benefits to people who don't have a meter, and that typically means renters. We know from the data that our city is um, struggling and that over half of our renters qualify as cost burden. What we have chosen to do is target and prioritize those families most at risk of eviction and therefore most at risk of the spiral downward that follows once you lose your home. This is a modest beginning. It is a program which I hope we can demonstrate its benefits over time and then scale it up. But I also want to acknowledge that a lot of time and thinking has gone into this to come up with a program that is legal, that is cost effective, that does not require creating new bureaucracy, and that targets the benefits to people who need them the most. So I'm very proud of the team that brought us here, and I just want to once again acknowledge the work of the Bureau leadership team, Director Stewart and his senior team, Kathy Cook, who is my mind, along with Andrew Abbey and a number of people, sort of treasures of our city in terms of the unsung work that they do day in, day out. <coughs> Liam Frost, and it's the last time I will mention his name, but he is, after all, working undercover for us now in the chair's office. Um, I want to thank um, the legal team for scrubbing this, our community partners, uh, particularly Home Forward, but many other partners who came together and helped us get it right. I want to thank the Citizens Utility Board of Oregon and the Portland Utility Board, and frankly, all the members of our community who made it clear that we needed to expand our program and helped us find a innovative way of doing so. And finally, I want to thank the auditor. Um, in the last few years, uh, we've seen a number of audits uh, that have been issued uh, provide incredibly valuable insights into how to strengthen and improve programs. And this is yet one of many examples. So to the auditor, uh, Hulk Caballero, uh, thank you for your work and your team's work. Um, as I look back on my service on this council, this is one of my proudest days. Like many good things, it took some time and we'll debug it over time but I hope that we can demonstrate uh, that this is good value for our ratepayers, and that we can scale this program to serve as many people as we can in a fiscally prudent manner. And again, I'm, today I'm very pleased to vote aye. Saltzman. Uh, well, I want to thank Commissioner Fish for his leadership on this issue. It's been a long time coming, and it's glad that we I'm really happy with the innovation and effort that we're putting forward here to, to make a, an erstwhile start on this. So thank you. Aye. You daily. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Fish and all the staff who, who worked on this. It, um, it is, uh, uh, I'm running out of steam up here. Sorry. Uh, 
I'm glad that you figured it out because I, I certainly didn't have any brilliant ideas to offer you. My apologies. I. Fritz. This has been the very definition of a gnarly issue. And so thank you, Commissioner Fish, for figuring that out with your team. Um, I very much appreciate this approach. And it provides funding for rent assistance, which is then going to get the money to the people who are most in need um, when paying their all-inclusive bill includes uh, water and sewer bill charges. So thank you. Hi. Mayor, by the way, if I could, I'm sorry the elementary kids weren't here for this conversation because we've managed to bring gnarly and erstwhile into the conversation. <laughs> we could ask the English teacher to actually tell us what erstwhile means, but I think I know it. Yeah, young person, we might <laughs> could do better. Wheeler. Uh, this is the definition of an issue that is both really hard to figure out, I'll accept gnarly <laughs> as the right answer, and thankless in the undertaking and very important in terms of those who are actually going to be assisted by it. I remember our very first conversation around this, Commissioner Fish, uh, I believe I asked the rookie question, what are other municipalities doing in this area? And the answer was there really wasn't any good template out there. Nobody's really been able to solve this program and therefore uh, there probably is no perfect solution to this program, but I applaud Commissioner Fish and I applaud uh, the staff for working really, really hard to move the ball forward in a very uh, discernible way. I think this is a huge improvement and it took a lot of work and a lot of thought and a lot of interaction and engagement to get it to here. Uh, and I think it's frankly, uh, Nick, it's just excellent leadership, well done. I vote aye, the ordinance is adopted. Next item is a second reading, 564. 564, authorize a competitive solicitation and contract with the lowest responsible bidder and provide payment for construction of the structural rehabilitation of Taggart Outfall, uh, project number for an estimated cost of $8 million. Very good, this is a second reading. Any further discussion, please call the roll. Fish. Aye. Sausman. Aye. Udaly. Aye. Fritz. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Colleagues, I've had a request that we take up item 545 at this particular time. And that was one that was pulled from the consent agenda. Item 545, authorize a five-year price agreements for construction, management, inspection, and project support personnel services for an amount not to exceed $25 million over five years. Good morning, Larry. So I'll tee it up real quick. Um, Mayor and colleagues, this is a procurement report from a competitive solicitation for the Bureau of Environmental Services for construction management, inspection, and project su support personnel services. Um, I'd like to welcome Larry Palat, procurement service manager, from the, uh, to give us a brief presentation. And I guess Scott Gibson is not joining us. Oh, fine. Thank you, Commissioner Fish. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Commissioners. I am Larry Blatt from. Larry, is your mic on? I'm not convinced uh, it is. Green lights on. Oh, okay. Just pull a Maybe little closer. It's not on. There you go. Thanks. It's not on. Just press the button. It's not on. There you go. It's on. Oh, yeah. It wasn't on. All right. <laughs> I can see the green it's line. It's green either way. Yeah, it's confusing. <laughs> You know, I can do procurement pretty well, turning on a microphone stuff. It I'm happens sorry. to the best of us. Starting over, good morning. I'm Larry Palat, procurement manager for, for procurement services. You have before you the procurement report recommending four price agreements to be awarded to four firms for a total not to exceed amount of $25 million. These price agreements are for a five-year period, will be utilized as the needs are presented and the specific projects identified in the Portland Bureau of Environmental Services budget process. Just a side note, because it usually comes up, people say $25 million. The money is a not to exceed amount, and if it's not required, it will not be spent. On December 12, 2017, the Chief Procurement Officer advertised RFP 801, and six proposals were received and opened on January 9, 2018. All proposals were deemed responsive to the requirements, and the proposals were evaluated by evaluation teams with specific areas of expertise. There is one small exception. There wasn't an MEP, a person from the Minority Evaluator Program, involved in this. They tried, they attempted with four evaluators, 
couldn't make the schedules line up, and sometimes that happens. Our minority evaluator community just can't. The schedules don't line up with the business needs of the Bureau. So in this particular case, they requested a waiver. A waiver was granted, but they did make four attempts. So they put a lot of effort into trying to get a minority evaluator. So, but the evaluation teams were diverse in makeup. They represented different areas from within the Bureau. The city <coughs> issued a notice of intent to award the price agreements on April 6th. No protests were received. This program, uh, procurement is a continuation of a successful trend in issuing price agreements for greater amounts to lessen the time spent by both the city and the vendors in drafting and responding to multiple solicitations for these types of services. The standard methodology requires consultants to propose with their utilization for State of Oregon certified disadvantaged minority women and emerging small business enterprises. But this has always been somewhat problematic for consultants as there are no defined projects because these price agreements are essentially labor only. They are not project specific. The consultants use their best efforts to hire and submit to the city as diverse as possible a list of qualified candidates to perform the necessary work. I believe this is another example of a major bureau and procurement services identifying an issue, developing a, a, a solution, and working together to build a process which moves the city further, forward and further it, furtherance of its goals and increased participation and capacity building. Um, all four of the consultants, an interesting sideline, have City of uh, Portland Business Tax Registration Accounts. They're in compliance with the city's contracting requirements and based on the expected spend over the next five years, the city's uh, forecasted budget, the confidence level for the dollar value is high. All four firms are State of Oregon certified firms. So even though there wasn't, there's not a specific uh, delineation on how much participation, all four firms are certified. So one way or another, all 25 million or whatever portion of it is spent ends up in the certified firm arena. So if the council has any questions regarding the bidding process, I can answer those, or Sarah Culp from BES is here to answer any specific questions. Colleagues, any questions? I'll entertain a motion. I would uh, move adoption of the report. <coughs> second. We have a motion from Commissioner Saltzman, a second from Commissioner Fish. Any further discussion? Please call the roll. Fish. Aye. Saltzman? Aye. Udaly? Aye. Fritz? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. Reports adopted. Next item, 565. 565, accept bid of James W. Fowler for the Montevilla South Sewer Rehabilitation Project for $2,974,850. Commissioner Fish? We'll turn it over to Scott Gibson and Larry Palat. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Fish. Good morning. For the record, my name is Scott Gibson. And with me is Larry Palat. Scott, Scott push the mic on, will you? Okay. He had the we, same green light problem I did. I don't feel so bad now. He's an engineer. He's just trying Thank to make you. you feel better, Larry. <laughs> whatever it takes, or whatever it takes. Good morning. I'm Larry Palat, procurement manager for, with Procurement Services. You have before you the procurement report recommending a contract award to James W. Fowler for the Montevilla South Sewer Rehabilitation Project in the amount of $2,974,850. The engineer's estimate on this project was $4 million and the Bureau's confidence level was high. The project was advertised the city's electronic procurement system. Bids were opened on April 8th. Four bids were received. In response, James W. Fowler is the lowest responsive responsible bidder at $2,974,850, which is 25.6% under the engineer's estimate. The Bureau of Environmental Services, along with Procurement Services, had identified an aspirational goal for certified disadvantaged minority women and emerging small business enterprise subcontractor and supplier utilization of 20%. Uh, James W. Fowler, acting as the prime contractor, identified the following areas as opportunities for subcontracting, uh, concrete cutting, boring, drilling and testing, rodent control, flagging and traffic control, trucking and hauling, as well as cure in place pipe installation and paving. There is a total of $639,938, or 21.49% of DMW ESB utilization identified towards the goal. And uh, the DM and W subcontractor participation represents 65.55% of the total utilization amount, and an ESB supplier participation at 34.45. Um, the areas of fire, if, if you don't need this stuff, I can skip it if somebody wants to just tell me. But 
anyway, DMWBE, $419,508, four firms performing concrete cutting, traffic control, boring, drilling, and testing, as well as the cure in place pipe installation, ESB at $220,000, performing trucking and hauling. Uh, James W. Fowler is located in Dallas, Oregon. They are not a state certified DMW ESB contractor. They do have a city of a current city of Portland business tax registration, and they are in full compliance with the city of Portland contracting requirements. Uh, funds are available for this project under owner cost E 10382. If the council has any questions about the procurement for the project, I can answer those. Uh, because the contractor met the aspirational participation goals for the project, we have not requested that they be in attendance today. However, Scott Gibson from BES is here to answer any project-specific questions you you're, might have. You're very thorough, Larry. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Fritz. So I didn't do an analysis on this. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah. It seems to me that James W. Fowler Company has been doing better, Were not was not good before, and is better, doing better. Is that... Am I they have been. If you go back and look, um, their percentages have moved from an average in 20, I did this not that long ago, I think it was 2016, they were they were averaged about 9%, 9, 9.5. They moved up subsequently to around 15. The last projects have all been uh, in that 18 to 22%. So, and to be honest, I credit the Bureau as pushing the, the, the contractors to perform better and to work harder, and I credit uh, the Procurement Services compliance staff with making resources available and working with them, and if they don't seem to, they say, oh, I can't find a firm in this area, we'll help them look and find somebody. So I, I, I think there's a lot of city effort on this, mostly from the Bureau. Well, for the record, colleagues, I did not tell Larry Plett ahead of time that I was going to ask that question. So it's even more impressive that he had all those numbers at his fingertips. <laughs> and, it is very um, impressive. Uh, but it just shows that we keep at it and we keep providing the resources and you keep saying, no, that's not acceptable. Thank you, Scott Gibson, for all your work on this too. Uh, Commissioner, can I just add one thing? Because they've, they've referenced um, the bureau team and procurement. My recollection, although... These days I question my recollection on just about everything, but my recollection is that on a number of occasions when the Fowler team was in the room and when one or more of my colleagues flagged or identified what they thought were numbers that fell below our expectations, that that message was directly communicated uh, to the company. And so I appreciate the fact that from time to time we do that to let you know, trusted partners in the contract uh, industry know that, that we think they're falling short. Did you want to have something to add, Scott? Yes, I wanted to thank the council for their leadership on this issue. I think the clarity and where we want to go on these goals has really helped everybody get behind, uh, behind the effort. And when the contractors do come here and hear what you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, as far as social justice through everything that you do, I think that they start to realize there's a connection between their work and what they're doing and these bigger issues. Um, so I appreciate you all for your leadership. I, I really do. And the, and the next one you'll see, we, we also made our targets on our next one. So this group of contractors who has been a good partner to us for many years and has been helping us rebuild our sewers has started to change and they have embraced these goals and these targets and they, they are starting to be better partners for us. Very good. Well, thank uh, you uh, to both the Bureau of Environmental Services and say, Procurement Services for your work on this. You know, the city's equity initiative is about jobs, contracts, and services. And BES has such a lot of the city's money through rates and in investing it in these major repairs that um, it's important in every single bureau. Sometimes people think it only matters in some areas of the city or not, and it doesn't. So would you please be sure to tell James W. Fowler that I did notice, and I appreciate their efforts. Commissioner Fish, thank you for your leadership of the utilities in pushing your bureaus, in appointing equity managers, because I think it is a matter of there's, there's the will, but we have to help people figure out how to do the way. And so thank you very much. We will address a handwritten note to them when we send them the contract this afternoon. <laughs> so let's make sure that happens. Uh, any further discussion? I'll entertain a motion. Move the report. Second. second. We have a motion from Commissioner Fritz, a second from Commissioner Fish. Sue, could you please call the roll? Fish. Aye. Salsman. Aye. Fritz. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The report's accepted. Next item, 566. 
Good morning. I'm Larry oh, Palat. Hang on just a second. Oh, let's, I'm sorry. I was waiting for... Now we have to do it all over again, Larry. We have to tee it up, too. All over. 5662. Six, six, just get excited. 566. Six, accept bid of Landis and Landis Construction, LLC, for the St. John's Cathedral Park Sewer Rehabilitation Project for $7,115,000, $144. Commissioner Fish. Mayor, I don't know whether Larry Palat and Scott Gibson are here, but if they are, let's let them... Uh, guide us through the presentation. <laughs> Gentlemen. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners. I'm Larry Palat from Procurement Services. You have before you the procurement report recommending a contract award to Landis and Landis Construction, LLC, for the St. John's Cathedral Park Rehab Sewer Rehab Project for $7,115,144. The engineer's estimate of the project was $7,740,000. The Bureau's confidence level was high. Project was advertised the city's electronic procurement system. Bids were opened on March 22nd, 2018. Four bids were received in response to the solicitation, and Landis and Landis Construction LLC is the lowest responsive responsible bidder at $7,115,144, which is $584,856, or 7.55% under the engineer's estimate. Uh, BES and Procurement Services had identified the standard aspirational goal of 20%. Landis and Landis, acting as the prime contractor, identified the following areas of opportunities for subcontracting, concrete cutting, trucking, traffic control, paving, and cure-in-place cure pipe installation. There is a total of $1,570,000, 22.1%. Uh, disadvantaged minority women and emerging small business subcontractor and supplier participation apportioned as follows. DBE disadvantaged, $690,000, three firms performing trucking, traffic control, and saw cutting. A WBE of $450,000 performing cure-in-place pipe installation. And an emerging small business at $430,000 with trucking and paving. Landis and Landis is located in Merrillhurst, Oregon. They are not a state certified MW, DMW ESB contractor. They do have a current city of Portland business tax registration and are in compliance with the city's contracting requirements. Uh, if the council has any questions related to the procurement for this project, I can answer them. Uh, since Landis and Landis as the prime contractor met the city's aspirational participation goals, we did not ask them to be in chambers this morning. However, Scott Gibson from BES is here to answer questions about the project if you have any. Colleagues, any questions? I'll entertain a motion. So mm -hmm. good, move the report. Second. Commissioner Fritz moves the report. Commissioner Saltzman seconds. Sue, please call the roll. Fritz. Aye. Excuse me, Fish? Aye. Saltzman. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The report is accepted based on the eloquent presentation of Scott. That's as funny as I get. That's my best <laughs> material. Next item, 567. Item 567, accept bid of Raymore Construction LLC for the Cooch play, Park Play Area Improvements and Lou Project for $1,056,403. Commissioner Fritz. I am very excited uh, with, to uh, be presenting this and to have this presentation. It's been a long time coming. Thank you to the community for uh, your patience. I'll turn it over to staff. Good morning. I'm Larry Palat from Procurement Services. <laughs> I'll do the front end, front part of this. You have before you the procurement report recommending a contract award to Raymore Construction, LLC, for the Cooch Park Play Area and Lou Project. The engineer's estimate of the project was $1,172,019, and the Bureau's confidence level was moderate. Bids were opened on April 17, 2018. Three bids were received in response to the solicitation. Raymore Construction, LLC, is the lowest responsive and responsible bidder at $1,056,403, which is $115,616, or 9.86% under the engineer's estimate. Portland Parks and Recreation Procurement Services had identified an aspirational goal of 20% DMW ESB uh, participation for this project. Raymore Construction, acting as a prime contractor for this project, identified the following areas for subcontracting opportunities, trucking, demolition, traffic, uh, playground installation, and landscaping. There is a total of $230,338, or 21.8%, of disadvantaged minority women and emerging small business subcontractor participation for this uh, project apportioned as followed. 
disadvantaged business enterprise performing trucking, uh, demolition and traffic control, $148,338, and an emerging small business at $78,083 performing playground installation. Raymore Construction LLC is a state certified MBE contractor and a participant in the city's prime contractor development program, which makes total disadvantaged minority women and ESB participation in this project, including the prime contractor at nearly 100% of the hard construction costs. Raymore Construction LLC is, is in compliance with the city's requirements for contracting. If the council has any questions uh, regarding the bidding process, I can answer those. Since the contractor has met the city's aspirational goals, we did not ask them to be in attendance today. And we have two representatives from Portland Parks and Recreation here to answer specific questions. Well, we'd like to give a short presentation about the uh, project. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, hello, uh, Mayor Wheeler and uh, commissioners. My name is Robin Laughlin. I am the bond project team lead with Portland Parks and Recreation. With me today is Gary Datka, our pro capital project manager representing the Bureau uh, in this project. Uh, we're here today to support Larry's request for council to accept the bid for Raymore construction for Cooch Park Playground and replacement, um, as well as the associated Lou project at this park. Uh, the Cooch Park project is part of the 2014 Parks Replacement Bond Program that has generously passed by voters uh, to approve $68 million bond measure to fix and repair uh, our most critical needs in our parks uh, without increasing our tax rates. As you know, the bond fund goes towards parks' most urgent needs in seven priority areas, playgrounds, trails and bridges, pools, accessibility, protecting workers, Pioneer Courthouse Square, and restrooms and other facilities. This project fits into two of our focused areas, playgrounds and restrooms, and it will be the fourth parks replacement um, program to cover playgrounds in our, in our system uh, going into construction this year. And with that, Gary will uh, share some of the details of the project. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Mayor Wheeler, Commissioners, my name is Gary Dotcom, I'm a landscape architect and project manager for Portland Parks and Rec. I'm uh, very excited to bring this project to you today to present it. Uh, Cooch Park is a three-acre park located in northwest Portland between northwest Gleason and northwest Hoyt and northwest 19th and northwest 20th. Uh, the project area is shown on the image above uh, and is focused on the west end of the park adjacent to Portland Public Schools Metropolitan Learning Center and focuses on the existing playground and brick plaza. The, the neighborhood, um, excuse me, the playground and plaza provide a much needed urban green space and play area for this neighborhood and also serve to support the MLC's outdoor play spaces during the school day. Cooch Park uh, today and of the past shows a very heavily used park, uh, one that many generations hold dear to their hearts. Uh, in the early 1990s, as you can see in the image in the top right, uh, we installed a well-loved uh, wood fort play structure that became an icon for the park. Unfortunately, this structure with its many steps and levels uh, was not accessible to all park users. Uh, over the years, the, the structure fell into disrepair and has been removed for safety reasons. Uh, prior to its removal, parks did install a smaller piece of play equipment, uh, but the playground as a whole lacked many of the play opportunities we look to provide for all of our users in our parks and playgrounds. Uh, the adjacent expansive brick plaza with its heaved and shifted bricks from tree roots uh, and time uh, create a number of ADA accessibility deficiencies uh, that are identified in our park's ADA transition plan uh, that provide barriers to all users, a uh, number of safety hazards, and long-term maintenance difficulties. Uh, additionally, it does not provide adequate seating for picnicking opportunities in community spaces. Uh, the restroom that's also shown in the lower image, the small green building, uh, has its own number of ADA deficiencies and creates a number of safety and visibility issues for all users. Uh, our project park, our project has a number of goals. Uh, the playground renovation and Lou project was one of the first bond projects started in 2015 and conducted extensive public outreach through a series of neighborhood meetings to engage with the Metropolitan Learning Center students, friends of Cooch Park, and the neighbors in the Na Northwest District Association to understand how each group uses the park and gain a positive community support for the renovations. In partnership with Harper's Playground uh, for additional project funding of $350,000, as well as a Metro Neighborhood Nature and Neighborhoods grant for $150,000, a 
we were able to design a fully inclusive and accessible play area for all users and caregivers uh, to have an equal opportunity to play at a safe and imaginative setting. Uh, the new playground includes uh, a new wood fort play structure with slides, climbers, and a lookout mound without the need for stairs or handrails, provides many other inclusive play structures and features, individual group swings, music, and sensorial uh, elements. Separate areas for social play and quiet play suitable for all kids are also included in the play area. Uh, as with all of our bond projects, durable rubber and synthetic turf surfacings are included in this project for long-term maintenance. The new plaza will include a decorative concrete paving that is better suited to heavy traffic and long-term maintenance the park needs. Uh, we will include a number of stormwater planters to minimize our impacts on utility infrastructure, uh, new accessible picnic tables, benches, and bike racks to support community needs. Uh, we will also be installing a Portland Loo, which will replace the public restroom that is currently in the park. The restroom will remain for events and PPR staff to use. Uh, this project does hope to begin as soon as possible following the MLC's school year uh, and contracting and we're anticipating starting in July. Uh, the construction uh, is anticipated to take about eight months and will take us through the winter of 2018, early 2019. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Larry uh, and have uh, to provide an over, well, you've already given the overview. <laughs> uh, so uh, ask you for your support and acceptance of the bid for Raymark Construction. Very good. Colleagues, any further comments? Commissioner Saltzman? I would move the report. Adoption of the report. Second. Commissioner Saltzman moves the report. Commissioner Fritz seconds. Any further discussion? Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Please call the roll, Sue. Fish. Well, it looks like a beautifully designed um, uh, playground and a, and a great addition uh, to that park. So thank you for your good work. Bye. Saltzman. Uh, yes, this one's been a long time in the making, so it's, it's yes. good to see it finally happening. Hi. Fritz? Well, I still have some nightmares about going to the uh, PTA at um, Montnomal Metropolitan Living Centre and telling them, yes, we've, fudged, we've fenced off your structure, and no, we don't have any money to replace it, and the aghast looks on everybody's faces, and, and that's the reality of what is in Portland Parks and Recreation today. We have a lot of ageing infrastructure that we don't have the funds uh, the city does not have the funds to fix. And so over the next six months, the, the Bureau will be leading a conversation about what do we have and what do we want to pay for and how do we want to pay for it. So thank you for your work with this very important bond measure. Thank you to Cody Goldberg of Harper's Playground. This is another um, advance in accessible playgrounds across the city. Every project that we've done under the bond measure has included some accessibility features and I very much, uh, I'm very proud of that. I'm also very proud of the largest expansion of restroom facilities in the history of Portland Parks and Recreation. Um, so when I'm gone you can put my name on a loo and I'll be very happy. Um, thank you very much for your, for your work. Aye. Wheeler. I think this is a, a fantastic vision and I appreciate all the hard work that's gone into it. Commissioner Fritz, thank you for your long standing leadership on this. It's a high volume park, it's used by a lot of people and uh, I think this will be very, very well received by the community at large and I believe it will be a community asset that we can all be proud of. I vote aye, reports accepted. Thank you. We have a couple of second readings in a row here, five, six, eight next. 568, approve fiscal year 2018-19 cost of living adjustments to pay for rates for non-represented classifications and elected officials. Specify the effect upon employees and the classifications involved and provide for payment. Second reading, call the roll. Fish. Aye. Salsman. Aye. Fritz. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next item 569, also a second reading. 569, revise secondhand dealer regulations to accept consular ID cards as identification, add gift cards as regulated property, and other housekeeping changes. This is a second reading. Please call the roll. Fish? Aye. Sausman? Aye. Fritz? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next item 570.
570, extend contract with Schneider Electric Systems USA, Inc. for the supervisory control and data acquisition system upgrade and increase compensation amount in the amount of $826,335. Commissioner Fish. Mayor and colleagues, this contract amendment is for the Portland Water Bureau to upgrade their existing software that allows Water Bureau operators to make adjustments to our drinking water infrastructure, such as adjusting valves and turning pumps on and off. The upgrade is also necessary to continue to receive security patches that prevent cyber attacks. Here with us today are Mike Stewart, Portland Water Bureau Director, and Chris Wanner, Water Group Manager for the Portland Water Bureau. Gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners. Um, supervisory control and data acquisition. I'm not sure that's really any clearer than SCADA. Um, it is, however, a very important uh, item in operating the Water Bureau. What we're looking to do today is two things. We need to extend the term of the contract to December 2019, um, and second, in this amendment authorize the expenditure of $817,696. The, uh, we're doing another thing that's important in this particular contract. In the past, we have done the O&M as one contract and the system upgrades as a separate contract. At the suggestion of Mr. Palat, whom I should have invited to stay, and BTS, uh, we've decided to combine them into one contract and spread the cost over, over the time period. Um, this thing will be building upgrades into our O&M system, and uh, the upgrades needed on this are to run on the Microsoft server. It is a separate computer system, but it has to run on the existing servers. <coughs> um, so we need upgrades to keep up with the city's upgrades of the servers. We need to be able to comply with Windows 10 because this thing runs in the background and we use Windows 10 and so on for it to operate. Uh, there's a variety of upgrades to the uh, SCADA system contract itself. We've been using this system for about 30 years in various names. Last name was Telvent. Uh, they were bought by Schneider Electric and hence you see the name, but it's the same computer system that we have always had. Um, we have a whole bunch of security patches that go on. This is very, very frequent. Uh, you don't see this stuff, but we see a lot of stuff from uh, UASI about uh, various cyber attacks and water systems, and we try and stay ahead of those. Um, besides the upgrade aspect, this thing is also our O&M contract for the Telvent system. Uh, they've been with us, as I said, almost 30 years. Their engineers have extensive experience with our system, both the, the operating system, the tanks, and so on, um, and provide 24-7 support. Um, why this is so important is in a lot of our valves and machinery and so on, we have PLCs, programmable logic controllers, and the SCADA system talks to those, gives the instructions out for raising and lowering tanks and so on. And it also communicates with the remote terminal units, RTUs, uh, that we use to actually operate the system in, in various locations. Um, we have stuck with this system because it's approved. Uh, it's kind of a sole source system, and it's one of those things that's approved by both procurement and the chief technology officer. That is about what I can tell you. Uh, Chris may have more wonky things. Uh, he can answer your questions. Mike or Chris, I have a question. On Friday, when we detected a small leak in one of our conduits, uh, was that a sensor that went off that then showed up in a com on our computers, or uh, is, is that an example of something where technology helps us uh, identify problems? So current technology would not pick up something like that, although as uh, technology advances, we're constantly looking at systems that may detect those types of uh, anomalies in our system. That was actually picked up by uh, one of our colleagues at Gresham, um, at uh, work for the city of Gresham. They noticed cool. the water in the street. They saw the water in the street? Yep. Mayor, this is just kind of a coincidence, but shortly after the news flash last Friday about um, the, the terrible events that occurred at Portland State University, um, we got word that, that there was a, a 
small leak in one of our conduits. You know, in moments like that, when you're not quite sure what's happening in one place and you start to think, is there any potential connection and um, are, are, these, are these related events or coincidental, um, uh, Mike's team jumped on it and was able to do a, a, a site inspection and determine that, in fact, these are completely unrelated. This was just a sort of an anomaly. And one of the things that was, I guess, one of the things that was comforting was to learn that the that the, uh, the the pipe that had the leak was actually buried pretty deep. So it would have been extraordinary uh, for someone to be able to uh, actually cause that leak. But you never know. And you know, it was just an example of a heightened state of alert that occurred once the news flash went out about uh, what happened at uh, the urban center. Very good. Is there any public testimony on this item, Sue? No one signed up. Great. Uh, good presentation. Thank you for making that understandable to me, even. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was great. Um, this is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Next item, colleagues, we have a four-fifths agenda item. If you could read the four-fifths item, 570-1. 570-1, authorize City Attorney to appear as amicus curiae on an amicus brief to be filed in support of the National Fair Housing Alliance in the case of National Fair Housing Alliance et al. v. Carson, seeking a preliminary injunction requiring the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development to immediately rescind its order suspending the requirements of the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule. Very good. I'll, is, Shannon, are you kicking us off today? Sure. Very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Commissioners, um, and uh, thank you for considering this uh, item on an emergency basis on four fifths. Um, as uh, we, as was indicated in the title, this would be um, for the city to join in an amicus brief um, to ensure um, the uh, an injunction against the rescission of a very important fair housing rule. Um, as you know, last month we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act, but it was not until 2015 that an actual rule to, um, to uh, make sure that we were meeting the requirements of the Affirmative Fair Housing Act was put into place under the Obama administration requiring that local governments um, not just evaluate the needs in their community in regards to fair housing, but actually submit detailed and concrete plans. Um, the uh, Trump administration <coughs> has proposed with Secretary Carson to repeal that rule, and a number of jurisdictions across the nation um, are seeking an injunction, as we mentioned, um, to keep that rule in place. Um, with that, I would turn it over to our um, city attorney who's worked and is working on this, uh, Lisa Gramp. Hi, Lisa Gramp, um, deputy city attorney. Um, so the rule would be suspended, just, to, just as a point of clarification. The, in, in January, Ben Carson suspended the rule, and um, we would be signing on to an amicus brief that has been drafted by the state of Maryland and with, along with other state and local jurisdictions in support of the of Fair Housing Alliance's um, suit against HUD and Ben Carson. Well, Ben Carson in his capacity as HUD secretary. Very good. Colleagues, any questions on this particular item? Any public testimony on this item? Please call the roll. Fish. Thank you for bringing this forward. Aye. Salzman. Aye. You daily. Very pleased that we're signing on to this. It's unfortunate how much of our time and resources we have to devote to protecting our community members from our own federal government. But this is apparently re the reality we live in now. So thank you. Aye. Fritz. I'm starting to lose count of the number of times we're having to sue the federal government, and that's so discouraging. But thank you for not being discouraged. Thank you for being <laughs> lawyers who, and uh, the Interim Housing Director Shannon Callahan, thank you for your work standing up for people who can't stand up and don't have a voice. And that's what the city is required to do in this situation, is to be the voice of those who are discriminated against by this ruling. Thank you. Aye. Wheeler. Glad to vote aye. I vote aye. The resolution is adopted. Last item, colleagues, was pulled from the consent agenda, item 547. 
547, amend mortgage birthage agreement uh, with Mike Allen for lease of birth space at the Columbia Point Yacht Club through May 31, 2019 at an annual cost of $3,600 for mortgage of Portland Fire and Rescue vessel boat, fire boat 17. Colleagues, PFNR operates three marine vessels at Station 17 located on Hayden Island where it responds to both land and marine emergencies on the Columbia River. Rescue Boat 17 and Fire Boat 17 are moored at the Columbia Point Yacht Club. Another reserve fire, boy, fire boat is moored at Columbia Crossings Marina. Portland Fire and Rescue currently leases a private boat slip at Columbia Point Yacht Club for fireboat number 17. The current lease agreement expires on May 31st, 2018, and an amendment is required to extend the lease agreement for another year. This ordinance authorizes the current lease extension and provides authorization for future lease extensions. Welcome. Excuse Commissioner me. Fritz, I'm Do sorry. Do we know who pulled this? Uh, lightning. So he's no longer here. And I, this is such a routine item. I'm so sorry that you've had to sit here for the entire day. If, if you'd like to go ahead and give your presentation, you can. But this, I have no idea why this was pulled. Do you have any questions about the fireboat? Yeah. <laughs> we need the fireboat. We need a place to put yep. the fireboat. Yeah. Uh, May 31st. So. <laughs> uh, to my calendar, it is May 30th, which means if we need to extend the lease, we have to do it by tomorrow. Correct. That is why this is here on an emergency basis and therefore why it was put on the consent agenda. It is a routine lease extension. Any public testimony on this item? Let's honor these people by getting them out of here as quickly as we can. Uh, Sue, please call the roll. Fish. Aye. Salzman? Aye. Udaly? Aye. Fritz? I just can't imagine why anybody would waste everybody's time to pull this for an annual cost of 3,600. <laughs> Can you imagine how, well I know how much it would be to build a, a house to, to put this fireboat in. It would be astronomical, this is such a good deal. Aye. Wheeler? I would still like to have the negotiation leverage. $3,600, are you kidding me? This once. <laughs> this once. I will vote for it. I vote aye. Ordinance is adopted. Thank you all for your time. Uh, just council. a quick comment. The fire bureau is here every um, uh, council session. Apparently, somebody from the fire bureau is always in attendance. So, is that correct? It's good to yeah, know. Yeah. In case they pull us, always have to be here. Okay, right. They're here every council That's session. That's great for us. <laughs> yeah. I know our meetings get hot sometimes, but I'm just wondering what's up. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. Thank you thank very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we are adjourned until 2 p.m. Uh, they're always here in case somebody Dad jokes. Such a waste of time.